Good morning. Good morning. I am Inez Barron, and I am the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. And we're gathered here today. I want to welcome you to this hearing on the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget, the fiscal 2020 preliminary mayor's management report, and the fiscal 2024 preliminary capital commitment plan for the City University of New York. We are joined by Matthew Sapienza, CUNY's Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer, and Alan Liu, who is the Senior Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning and Management. And thank you for joining us today. And just before we get started with the topic for the day, you know, we are in Women's History Month, so I just wanted to share a brief bio about one of the people whom I admire greatly, and that is none other than Mary McLeod Bethune. She was born in 1875, passed away in 1955, and her parents had been formerly enslaved, and she was the last, or one of the last, of 17 children. Uh, her mother worked to buy the land that they had formerly worked on, and uh, Mary McLeod Bethune was able to pick 250 pounds of cotton each day by the age of nine. She did leave North Carolina where she had attended school and moved to Florida. If, there, if you could try to fix this system, it's a little bit too much feedback. Thank you. Uh, she moved to Florida and she took $2.50 and established a school. It was the Daytona Beach Literary and Industrial School for Training Negro Girls. And she started with five young ladies and her own son. And that did evolve into Bethune-Cookman College when it merged with Cookman College, and it issued its first degree in 1943. Mary McLeod Bethune was the founding president of the National Council of Negro Women. She was a member of the so-called Black Cabinet, which advised President Roosevelt. She was vice president of the NAACP, and she fought strenuously against the discrimination and the lynching that was prominent at that time. And she also fought for women's rights as well. And she was the only woman of color at the founding conference of the United Nations in 1945. So I just wanted to highlight some of what she did. She was an educator, she was a humanitarian, she was an author, she was a statesman, and she was an entrepreneur. And just wanted to make mention of her accomplishments during this month of celebrating the great accomplishments of women. It has been my honor to sit as chair of this committee since fiscal 2015. And in those 10 years and the 11 separate budget hearings, I have made clear just how important it is to me that we have an increase in the, attain the retention and elevation of black faculty, that we freeze tuitions, hopefully being able to roll it back to the point where there is no tuition, and that we have the study that impacts the affordability and accessibility for students that we provide more childcare supports, and that we increase the base aid formula from the state. These issues are still pertinent to me and to this committee as we wait to see what will come down from the state in its enacted budget. CUNY is planning to increase community college tuition. CUNY is planning to increase community college tuition by, two, by $320, and it's including a new $120 fee in health and wellness fee this fall. This matter is most distressing as the tuition increase will have a compounded impact on our students who have limited financial means. And I want to know what conversations CUNY has had with the administration to mitigate this increase. But before I get to those questions, I want to continue to discuss the budget from a broader vantage point. Specifically, CUNY's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget of $1.2 billion does not change much from its fiscal 2020 adopted budget. As mentioned, there are items in the state's 2021 executive budget that remain in question at this point of time, such as the state share of support for early child care services and the ASAP programming. The fiscal 2021 preliminary budget also does not include the council initiative support, such as funding for the Peter Valone Scholarship 
or the university's development of programs. We will, of course, want to discuss all of these things today. The council's approach to its preliminary budget hearing is to ensure that the city budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to all New Yorkers. While efficiency, which oftentimes means cuts, while efficiency and performance have always had been priorities of this body, today we plan to scrutinize the organization of the city budget more closely. For CUNY, this will mean we want to have a conversation again about the limited number of units of appropriation used to describe vast areas of the university spending, particularly around the community colleges. We'll be taking a closer look at how CUNY organizes its six hundred and sixteen million capital commitment plan and many city agencies CUNY among them develop plans that commit only a fraction of that amount CUNY has been planning more carefully with OMB and I'm pleased to state that their commitment rates have increased since fiscal 20, 2019's 75 percent in years prior CUNY's commitment rate was as low as 11 percent or as high as 36 percent I look forward to learning more about how the university prioritizes its capital budget projects and expect that CUNY will continue on this upward trend. This hearing presents us with an opportunity to yet again review, another, to review other programs and activities at CUNY as well. The state's requirement that all SUNY and CUNY campuses have food pantries raised important questions about costs and funding sources and would like to see where we are presently and how CUNY students who are struggling to meet other needs are, based, are meeting this challenge. I'm also happy that the new council funded a food initiative in fiscal 2020, and perhaps the administration will turn and pick up this funding of $1 million in fiscal 2021 and baseline the program so CUNY can expand these critical services. And turning to academics, CUNY has developed a number of programs and services to better meet the needs of its 21st century learners over the past few years. And I would like for us to discuss these as well. As always, I look forward to discussing hiring practices and the need for increased diversity both at CUNY's campuses and within its central administration. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Brad Lander, and I would like to acknowledge others who've worked to prepare for this hearing. Joy Simmons, my Chief of Staff, M. Indigo Washington, my Director of Legislation, and CUNY Liaison, Michelle Perrigan, the Finance Analyst for this committee, Isha Wright, the Unit Head, Paul Senegal, the Counsel to the Committee, and Chloe, Chloe Rivera, the Senior Policy Analyst for the committee. And with that, I will ask the council to uh, administer the oath. Good morning. Uh, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. Matthew Sapienza. Alan Liu. Thank you, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and, and members of the committee. I am Matthew Sapienza, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. I'm very pleased to be joined this morning by Alan Liu, Senior Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning, Construction and Management. Senior Vice Chancellor Liu was appointed in December 2019 after a successful career in Washington, D.C. as the City Administrator. And in addition to being an alumnus of City College, is the first Asian American Vice Chancellor in CUNY's history. Alan and I are also joined by several of our colleagues from the university who will assist in responding to questions and concerns from the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about the mayor's fiscal year 21 preliminary budget and its effect on the City University of New York. Chairperson Barron and members of the committee, we very much appreciate your strong and continuing advocacy for our students. At a time of growing inequality, CUNY has become a national leader in promoting upward social and economic mobility. In 2019, six CUNY colleges placed in the top 25 nationally on CollegeNet's 2019 Social Mobility Index, with Baruch College ranking number one for a fifth straight year. CUNY also dominated both the Forbes and Wall Street Journal's best value college rankings. 
We are proud of our affordable value. Two out of three CUNY undergraduate students do not pay for tuition and fees out of pocket, and three out of four of our graduates leave debt free. CUNY tuition remains of high value and continues to be much lower than other university systems throughout the country. Likewise, CUNY's average cost of fees of $475 are substantially lower than those of other, of other public university systems of comparable size throughout the country. Our history and reputation of delivering high quality affordable education and promoting social mobility help explain why freshman enrollment rose 3% this past fall, countering the national trend. It was part of a 17% increase since 2010, a decade in which freshman enrollment for universities nationwide remained largely flat. We are also proud of our recent historic agreement with our faculty union, the Professional Staff Congress, which provided well-earned increases for our full-time and adjunct faculty. Chair Barron, we very much appreciated the opportunity to discuss this topic at your recent hearing on January 30th. As I testified at that hearing, the university is grateful that the fiscal year 2021 city preliminary budget included funding to fully cover the costs of this collective bargaining agreement. In our fiscal year 21 budget request, we have a renewed drive to expand our sources of revenue for CUNY. This approach is aligned with our belief that CUNY, the state, and the city share an obligation to the future of all New Yorkers. To that end, we are proposing partnerships with the state and the city, along with the private sector and philanthropic community, to tackle the daunting economic, environmental, and social challenges ahead. Now let me speak to the city's preliminary budget. We are pleased that the city's financial plan provides assistance for our community colleges with funding for mandatory costs related to fringe benefits, building rentals, and contractual salary increases. The preliminary budget also includes a $6 million efficiencies target in fiscal year 2021, for which we will work with our community colleges to develop strategic savings initiatives. We are grateful to the City Council, particularly to the, the Higher Education Committee, for securing resources in the current year's budget for the Valone Merit Scholarships. We will ask for your advocacy again, as funding for this critical student support program was not included in the fiscal year 21 preliminary budget. This initiative provides financial aid to students who graduated with an 80 average from New York City high schools and who maintains a B average at the university. These merit-based awards are available to deserving students both the senior colleges and community colleges and are a significant contribution to our efforts to speed time to degree. They demonstrate to our students in a tangible way that their city makes it possible to pursue an excellent post-secondary education right here at home. We look forward to working with you to, in ensuring that these financial aid awards are protected. We also need your help in restoring $2 million that was provided for remediation in the current fiscal year. CUNY has developed a plan to better tailor remedial instruction to the needs of its students and to accelerate their degree progress. The university is also appreciative of the council's current year allocation of $1 million for a food security initiative, as you mentioned, Chair Barron. We have allocated those funds to our community colleges and the results have been encouraging. As of December 31st, 2019, 42% of the eligible students accepted our offer to participate in the food program. We anticipate that the enrolled students will receive a total of $800 for the fall 2019 and spring 2020 semesters. It is critical that this allocation is restored in the fiscal year 2021 budget. Our success with this initial cohort leads us to believe that an increased allocation can have a profound impact on a much greater number of students. We are also seeking restorations for our community college child care centers and adult literacy programs in the FY21 city budget. Additional needs to support CUNY's ongoing efforts to in increase completion rates are highlighted in our fiscal 21 budget request. We are seeking city investment in several significant endeavors, one of which is increased support for associate degree programs at our comprehensive colleges. The amount provided for these programs has remained constant at $32.3 million since 1995. Simply applying the higher education price index over that time period would result in additional $34.2 million in annual recurring support. The first category of strategic investments in our budget request focuses upon proven approaches that expand access, enhance learning, and accelerate success towards degree completion. We propose to expand the Accelerate, Complete, and Engage program, the ACE program, which is the sister companion of our ASAP program at our senior colleges, and support other academic momentum initiatives. 
We are also seeking to expand the support and support the growth of a diverse body of full-time faculty through the addition of 500 new full-time faculty lines over the next four years. Second, we need to embrace the future of work and improve our students' quality of life in a rapidly changing, globally competitive economy. Our third area of investment recognizes that the physical and mental health and well-being of our students are integral components of student success. The fourth and final area of investment included in our budget request covers strengthening the university's infrastructure through increased allocations to campus maintenance and information technology. I would also like to take a moment to address the federal budget. The recent budget proposal released by the White House would eliminate the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grants Program, the SEOG program, and would reduce the Federal Work Study Program by half. Tens of thousands of CUNY students rely on SEOG and work study for financial aid as well as valuable work experience. We are grateful that the House and Senate has rejected previous calls for reductions in these critical financial aid programs and ask for their assistance again in, in the upcoming budget cycle. Chairperson Barron and members of the committee, please be assured that the university community deeply appreciates your continued commitment to a high quality CUNY education, which is the vehicle that so many New Yorkers rely on for the path of upward mobility. I would now like to ask Senior Vice Chancellor Liu to talk about CUNY's capital program. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and committee members. I'm Alan Liu, the, the new Senior Vice Chancellor of Facilities, Planning and Construction Management at CUNY. It is my pleasure to be here today. I'm happy to have this opportunity to discuss with you our capital budget. I'm glad to be back at CUNY, where I attended architecture school at the City College and in New, York, in New York City, where I was born and raised. The City Council has been an outstanding partner to CUNY, especially to our community colleges, by providing support for critical maintenance work and major new buildings. In recent years, your support has been instrumental in helping CUNY to complete the purchase of the former Jewish Jewish Center across from Queensborough Community College, which will be used for the expanded ASAP program. Also to complete North Hall's new quad at, at Bronx Community College, a major expansion of libraries at Medgar Evers and LaGuardia Community College, creation of a new dining facility at Queensborough Community College, and the renovation of 500 Grand Concourse Building fourth floor at Hostos Community College. All these projects added or upgraded space and have enriched those campuses with modern, well-designed facilities that inspire students. Several of these projects have additional phases that are active, which you, will, you, will, you have also supported. Also with your support, we have been able to start design on the new Allied Health and Science Building for Hostels Community College. This major facility will provide modern classrooms and science labs for the college's Allied Health programs, which provide essential workforce development. In addition, it, it will house a dental clinic that will provide students with practical experience and furnish the community with expanded services. In recent years, the council has provided over $270 million to CUNY and funded hundreds of projects, in particular at the community colleges where the need is greatest. Because of your generous support of critical maintenance funding, CUNY has been able to address some of the most challenging infrastructure issues at these campuses. In particular, your allocation of lump sum funds that allow CUNY to add to projects that are in process has helped CUNY move several important critical maintenance projects along. Last year, the council provided CUNY $10 million, which CUNY has requested a state match that would, take, that would then make it $20 million. As you know from previous discussions, achieving a, good, a state of good repair within the system is CUNY's priority. Without the city funding, we cannot access any state funds. By some accounts since um, FY 2012, the state has provided $3.1 billion in funding for CUNY capital projects, both senior colleges and community colleges. And it proposes another $685 million in CUNY capital uh, appropriations for FY21. One of the largest ongoing critical maintenance projects is the replacement of the facade of LaGuardia Community College's Center 3 building. This enormous building with 882,000 square feet is 100 years old. Its facade had to be replaced to preserve the building. I'm happy to report that we expect to complete the construction of this $125 million project by the end of this year. 
I hope you will all take pride in, real, in the realization of what will be a community treasure. Other critical maintenance projects that have benefited from council funding are the ongoing campus-wide utility upgrades at, at Bronx Community College, roughly totaling $161 million. Currently, we have completed phase four and are starting phase five, and there's still another phase which will start, the, start design next year. The phase renovation of Hostos Community College's 500 grand concourse building continues. We're currently bidding the renovation of the third floor and basement and the cooling tower replacement at, at, at the borough of Manhattan Community College. Roof replacements and fire alarm and bathroom upgrades across the university on, on many campuses. We're pleased to report all this activi activity must emphasize that critical maintenance continues to be a major capital priority at our community college campuses, and we're still in need of your support for the long-term effort. We have over 7 million square feet of community college facilities, three quarters of which is over 40 years old. The most serious need is still infrastructure systems that support facility operations. Continuing deterioration of these systems could lead to costly emergency repairs and in some cases, major system failures. $750 million is needed to keep the backlog, backlog of deferred maintenance from growing. So you will continue to see requests for critical maintenance funding from our colleges. This year, approximately $200 million in identified projects need funding to cover critical facility items such as fire alarms, roofs, boilers, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, facades, and windows. We're also pleased to inform you that we are starting construction on our expansion of space in Inwood for the, for, the, for the CUNY in the Heights program associated with Borough of Manhattan Community College. The expansion will allow us to continue to increase vital higher education services to the community, including substantially increasing credit-bearing classes at the center, providing many career ladders to educational attainment and careers. We anticipate work will be complete for the fall semester. We continue to seek additional city and state funding for the, for the Hostos Allied Health and Science Building that I mentioned. And we very much need funding for another important initiative, which is $50 million for a new permanent facility for Gutman Community College. We're investigating different options for their expansion. I think it is worth reminding you that for every dollar of city funding we receive for community colleges, the state matches it, doubling our buying power. The work on our facilities continues and is integral to realizing those important goals. CUNY is a community treasure. Thank you for your support and for all that you do for, the, for CUNY and, and New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your testimony. And now we have a series of questions on matters that are of critical importance and which we want to make sure get on the record so that we can uh, proceed in examining these issues. So CUNY has a total proposed budget of $1.2 billion for fiscal 2021 all of which is still organized into three broad categories or paired units of appropriation. But more than 95% of all that money falls into one of these pairs, supporting the community colleges. The question is, the council has brought this to CUNY's attention several times already. How is the conversation proceeding with the Office of Management and Budget about restructuring funding for the community colleges into more units of appropriation. Thank you, Chair Barron. Um, as you stated, the, the, we have a total of five units of appropriation, a, P, a personal services unit of appropriation for community colleges and an other than personal service appropriation for the community colleges. Same for the Hunter Campus Schools, which are funded through the city budget, a, a PS and an OTPS unit of appropriation, and then a unit appropriation for the senior colleges. And then what'd you say the last part? I'm sorry, uh, there's a unit appropriation for the senior college funding that um, is provided by the city. So there's five in total. Um, for the community colleges, however, within those two units of appropriation, there are unique uh, budget codes for each of the seven community colleges so that budget and expenditures can be tracked for each of those seven. Um, having said that though, um, we are um, definitely open in having discussions with both the council finance committee and the council members and the office of management and budget about providing more transparency and clarity about the budget and we're open to creating new units of appropriation um, and we're happy to have those discussions with the administration and the council to provide um, as much transparency as needed. 
So since we last asked about this, which I guess would be about a year ago, what meetings have taken place? We've, we've had no further discussions with the administration about this. So that's disturbing for there not to have been any pursuit to address an issue which was brought to your attention mm -hmm. a year ago. So we need to make sure that we can sit with you and schedule some dates to make sure that they go forward in any way that the council can help facilitate that. I think that that would be critical. Otherwise, we'll come back next year yeah. without having had any discussion on that as well. Understood. The council's oversight role requires greater transparency, and this is the route to achieve this clarity required for, to perform smoother operations. So when can we expect to hear that this change has been transpired? Do you expect that prior to next year's budget we will have had some changes? Because as you, yeah. look at, as you look at the graphic that's there, you can see the greatest percentage is in the community, administ the central administration, and other. That's the greatest percentage. Yeah. So all of those units of appropriation, we would like to be able to break that down and to see exactly how those funds are distributed. Yeah, and we can provide a breakdown of that. And let me, and, and thank you for, for providing that chart um, because it does provide some further explanation. The central administration and other amount of 413 million, the majority of that are for expenses that are incurred on behalf of the colleges. The largest of which- Give me an example. Yeah, the largest of which is for fringe benefits costs. And that's um, a, a slightly less than $200 million. It's about $196 million of that 413 are for fringe benefits costs. Um, so that's for health insurance, for, uh, social security expenses, welfare fund payments um, and uh, for our employees at the community colleges. So the big chunk of that is for fringe benefits. Um, there's about 23 million of that that's for energy costs at our campuses as well, or our community college campuses, I should say. And then a large chunk of that are for individual programs that are funded in the central administration other category at the beginning of the year and then are allocated out to the campuses. So, for instance, uh, an example of that would be for the ASAP program. There's, I think, $86 million funded for ASAP by the city. That's funded in that category. And then at the beginning of every year, the university determines how much each of the seven community colleges will receive. And then those funds are, are transferred to the community colleges. So, of that $413 million, only $12 million is actually for the central administration. Um, the rest of it are costs that are incurred on behalf of the colleges or that are allocated to the colleges um, throughout the fiscal year. And we can provide backup to that and give you as much detail as you'd like um, regarding that category. Okay. So you'll put, give us a breakdown of how it's allocated to the seven community colleges? Well, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how is it that each community college re is determined to receive in a particular amount. What formula do you use to determine how much each community college will receive? Is it based on the number of students or what yeah. other factors are a part of it's, that? It's mostly, the main factor is the number of students. Um, there are some other factors that are uh, included in the model. Um, so for, for instance, facilities, um, we do part of the allocation model includes costs for running facilities and we'll include um, things like square footage of the campuses. We have a density factor for um, the schools that um, maybe have less square footage, but, but more usage in terms of the, the uh, schedule and the calendar. Um, but the main factor that drives the allocation for the community colleges is the number of students. And we use a, a three-year weighted average um, to try to offset any uh, significant spikes, whether they're increases or decreases in any one year, so we use a three-year weighted average. The PMMR tells us that the average cost to instruct a community college student is $15,620 from fiscal 2019. Mm -hmm. Is that the same cost across each community college? And if not, can we be provided with the cost per community college to instruct a student? Yeah, um, Chair Barron, it's not the same across the, the all seven colleges, and I don't have each of the individual college numbers, but we'll certainly provide that to you. 
Um, some of our smaller community colleges, like Gutman Community College and Hostos, um, because of their size, because they're so small, the cost per student will be larger. College like BMCC, which has 20, over 25,000 students, their cost will be smaller. But we'll provide you with the breakdown of all seven. And what is the average cost to instruct a Hunter College campus student in the high school and in the elementary school? Um, that I do not have, but again, we will, we will get you that information. Talking about the Hunter College campus students and that, that program, yep. uh, there are some concerns that I have regarding student selection. Mm -hmm. uh, the population of students at Hunter College Elementary and Hunter College High School is very, very, very low, extremely low. And it gets to the question again about the criteria that's used in selecting the students. So can you talk briefly about that process and what's being done to look at other kinds of criteria so that we can have a better reflection of the population? Because we certainly know that there are black and Latino students that qualify mm -hmm. and uh, why they're not selected. As we look at those students who are black and Latino who are level four, that percentage is not reflected in the population at the Hunter College campus schools. Yeah. Um I can't speak too much to the selection process. Um, I know there is an exam um, that is given um, and based on some of, the, similar to the other um, selective high schools in New York City, there is an exam given. Um, but other than that, um, I don't have too much more information, but we will speak to the folks at Hunter about that and get some more. And in addition, we will provide you with data on the demographics of the student body as well. And what is, can you describe for me the funding that does go to the Hunter College campus? What are the funding streams? What's the city, the state? How um, is that? For Hunter Campus Schools, it, it's funded um, solely by the city. So, for, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it is considered a uh, New York City public school, although it's run by CUNY, by Hunter College, and Jenna, you're a proud alum of. Um, but the funding is provided uh, through the city of New York. Some of the, um, some of the supports that are in place, for, for instance, the administration of Hunter College um, that provides support to the Hunter Campus Schools, that's funded by the state. But those are really indirect costs that are funded by the state for the Hunter Campus Schools. So, so the indirect costs are funded by state? Yeah. Okay. Who decides how many presidents, vice presidents, deans, associate deans, assistant deans, provosts, and so on uh, are at each community college? Yeah, Th those are all local decisions made by the, by the campus president. Um, every college is unique in terms of what their administrative structure is, but for the most part, um, when you look at the executive leadership of a, of a community college, um, in addition to the president, obviously, most of them will have a provost, which will be in charge of the academic um, programming at the, at the college. Most of them have a vice president for finance and administration, which will be involved for the fiscal management and the administrative um, operations of the campus. Usually those VPs for finance and admin have facilities, HR, IT, all under them as well. Um, and so those are usually the, the, the two main areas of the campus that are led by the provost and the vice president of finance for administration, and those will report to the president. But um, there's not um, a, something that CUNY prescribes to each campus that you must have um, these titles or people in these specific roles. That's really up to the college president to decide how to best run his or her campus. So there's no prescribed ceiling in terms of the personnel? Correct. Okay. That's correct. Each president will decide. That's correct, yes. We would like to request the senior management organization tree for each community college with their salary and tenure in that position. Sure. Thank we you. will work with our colleges to get that information and get it to you. And the fiscal 2021 financial plan includes that there are no new needs for CUNY. So I thought that was a typo. <laughs> Yes, it is. Um, we do have new needs, and I just I want to tout our budget request, our fiscal 21 budget request, which was approved by our board of trustees back in uh, December. 
Um, and so this budget request totals 292 million in total. Um, of that request, we have committed that we will find 15 million in efficiencies next year, which bring the request down to 277 million in total. Um, and from that, we are requesting um, 126 million from the state, 77 million from the city. Can you give me that again? I want to make right. sure I get a full understanding here. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chair Barron. It's, no. uh, it's a total is 292 million right. in our budget request on, on the operating budget. 15 million of which we will sell fund through efficiencies. Um, and that brings the total request that we're seeking down to 277 million. And of that, we're seeking 126 million from the state, 77 million from the city, and the rest would come from uh, tuition and fee increases, um, some of which will be paid out of pocket by the students and some of which will be covered by increased um, financial aid um, through both the state and the federal government. So I'm very disturbed that CUNY continues to burden students with increasing tuition for public education. It's my belief that all of CUNY should be free, which it was when I was able to attend, and that was why I was able to attend college, because it was free based on anyone graduating from a city a high school with at least a B average. And we've moved away from that. And the trend that I've seen is that students are bearing more and more of the burden of the cost of education. And so what are we looking at in terms of trying to flip that back to what it was, you know, putting a stop, freezing these tuition increases, hopefully looking back, we're hearing very much now conversations about at least extending uh, post high school education to students free of cost so that they can be better prepared to function in this society. So CUNY continues to push for these increases, increases, increase, and it's going against the grain of what's happening as well as not recognizing or responding to the increasing student debt, student debt, the loan, stu the loan debt that students have. Mm -hmm. So what, what is CUNY trying to do here? Why can't they exert more pressure on the state, on the city, to bear more of the cost for educating students? No, uh, we, we understand your concern, and, and we have the same concerns, and we take tuition increases very seriously. Um, I think something that um, proves how seriously we've taken it is that community college tuition we have frozen for the last four years. It's been, uh, for resident students, um, they pay $4,800 a year right. at the community college, and that's been frozen for four years. Um, what I would say about tuition is um, at our senior colleges, so community college is $4,800. Senior colleges this year for a resident student is $6,930 per year. So it's still incredibly affordable when you compare our tuition to other public university systems throughout the country and certainly compared to the private universities here in New York. Um, but what I would say about tuition is we're very fortunate that we do have financial aid um, programs in place both at the state and city levels and the federal level as well that help offset those costs. So as I mentioned in my testimony, two thirds of our undergraduate resident students because of financial aid attend tuition free. Um, so two thirds of our students um, at the undergraduate level are attending for free. Um, and at the community colleges that increases to about 70%. Um, so we do have a, a majority of our students attending for free and only about 17% of our undergraduate students pay the full price, that 69.30 that I mentioned for the senior college. But we know that the, um, there are other related educational costs beyond tuition, and they sometimes far outweigh what the tuition is. And there is little provision for that. There's no consideration of that with the governor's Excelsior scholarship. So the, the burden and, uh, the inequity is borne by those who have the greatest need. And we also know about the tap gap, but as we're talking about the fees and, and uh, costs that students are bearing, in December 18th, 2019, this committee held an oversight hearing on the child care centers. Yes. And learned that while the campus child care center at City College has been closed for four years, 
for a project that was designed to take one year, with student fees of $2 per student have remained in effect. So why are you collecting the student fee for child care centers at an institution that does not have a child care center, and where does that money go? Mm -hmm. the, the fees that are collected for the child care center are through uh, what's called the student activity fee. Right. And those fees um, are not um, set by the university. They, they're set by the college working with each individual student government at the campus. Um, and so the, they, they range. The, every campus has a different student activity fee. Um, so we will speak with the folks at City College and find out if they are ch still charging a fee for the child care center as part of their student activity fee, and if so, find out what those revenues have been used for since the center's been closed. So we'll, we'll do more investigation on that, more research, and find out and get back to you. Part of what students indicated when we met at City College was that they are ill-prepared to fully understand these agreements that are presented to them. Many of them are new. They haven't been given these budgets prior to seeing them, and they're pretty much intimidated, and they go along and sign, and as the year goes on, then they understand what it is that they've actually signed an agreement to without having full understanding. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we can find a way to be uh, more proactive in getting that information to them so that yes. they can really have an effective voice in saying what it is that is happening with those fees. And um, we want to find out what happened to that $2 per student for the last four years. Is it in a separate dedicated bank account? And were students given an opportunity to say, oh, I, I, we want to recognize Council Member Alan Maisel, who is a member of the committee. Thank you. I uh, want to call attention that he was here. Um, so we want to make sure that the students who are paying the fee have an opportunity to benefit from that payment during the time that they're in school. Understood. If students left within four years, they didn't get the benefit of that. And yes, it sounds like, oh, it's only $2, but when you multiply that by whatever the student enrollment is and multiply that by four years, it becomes a significant amount Understood. of money. We, we will work with President Boudreaux and, and his administration to get more information and get that to you quickly. And continuing, uh, there are six contracts within the budget for child care centers. What are these contracts for, specifically? Um, I'm not certain which specific um, contracts that you might be referring to within the child care centers, but um, as you know, we, we do have 16 child care centers um, at our campuses. They provide a very valuable resource to our student parents. Um, we, What's the model that's used in these child care centers? Is it different across each of the community colleges? Um, yeah, I think most of them are, are similar, but I think there, there are some different programming at uh, each individual college. And, um, but the one thing that I like to always point out when I talk to folks about the child care centers is um, they also provide not only a valuable service to our student parents, but also to the child that is in the center because they're providing educational yes. programming to those children. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a great benefit um, as well. Um, so most of them are um, similar. I mean, some of them have greater capacity than others. We are concerned about and, and we're you know, seeking the council's help in restoring $600,000 for our child care centers in the 21 budget. Yes. Um, at, on the state budget, um, we're, we have been talking to the folks in the Senate and Assembly. We have a $900,000 restoration that we need for our community college child care centers on the state side. Um, so we're cons you know, we are lobbying the Senate and Assembly for those restorations. Um, but most of the college um, community, most of the college child care centers, I should say, do operate the same. But like I say, some have a greater capacity than others. I know some um, are open to staff as well as students because they have that capacity. But for the most part, um, they operate in a similar fashion. So I have a few more questions before I break and ask my colleague to share questions and then I'll come back again. Sure. But sticking on this topic of fees, uh, the budget includes $17.6 million from technology fees from all seven community colleges. Mm -hmm. But these fees aren't all of the fees that are collected. Right. So how many fees are there at all of the community colleges and what's the total sum that's collected from these fees alone? 
from all of the community colleges. So there are three um, what we call mandatory fees at, at all of our colleges, both senior colleges and community colleges, the mandatory that all students must pay them. Um, so the first one is what you mentioned, Chia Ben, the student technology fee, $125 a semester. Um, and it was implemented in 2002. So that, that was the last mandatory fee that we've added at the university it was 2002. Um, and it pays for um, technology enhancements at the campuses. And one of the great things about the technology fee is that students have a voice in how the technology fee is used. So every campus um, has a committee um, that students participate in that um, make recommendations to the college president as to how those uh, fee resources can be used. And I know, Chair Brown, I know you've, you've visited a lot of our campuses throughout the years, and uh, many times you'll see a, um, a computer lab or, or new PCs in the library, and most of the time those are funded with the resources from the fee. So the student technology fee is the first mandatory fee. The second fee um, is what we call the consolidated fee, and that's $15 a semester, um, and that's been $15 for um, at least 15 years, has not changed in a very long time. And that's to pay, um, cover the expenses of um, costs that um, the university pays for on behalf of students. So that could be um, financial aid processing, that could be the cost for, for doing testing. Um, it's to help offset the costs that um, we have in those areas. And then the third is what we mentioned earlier, which is the student activity fee. Those are mandatory also, but those aren't set by the university. Those are set by the individual campuses in working with the student, local student governments. And so those range, as there's some campuses that are as low as $60 a semester, and there's some that are high as $180 a semester. So it varies amongst the campuses. But on average, um, our fees total about $475 per year um, which is incredibly low throughout the country. Um, when you look at uh, comparisons, I mean, even uh, our wonderful colleagues at SUNY who do a great job, um, and, and they are terrific co colleagues, but SUNY's average fee per year is $1,700. Ours is 475 and when, again, when you look throughout the country, most public university systems are well over $1,000, and most are close to $2,000. So our fee structure is still very low. Um, and as I said, we haven't ha created a new mandatory fee since 2002 when we um, implemented the technology fee. In the approaching academic year, 2020-2021, a $120 health and wellness fee, uh, $60 per semester, has been at will be added to the community colleges per student. Mm -hmm. How much from this fee alone does CUNY anticipate receiving and what exactly will this fee be used for? Mm -hmm. So the, the, um, the health and wellness fee that we have proposed to implement for, for the fall semester, and again, it's our first new mandatory fee since 2002, we project that university-wide, for both the senior colleges and the community colleges, it'll generate a little less than $30 million. But I believe 30, $30 million. $30 million. I believe the number was $29.8 million. Um, and we, um, we anticipate that this will be used in a very similar fashion to what I just described as the student technology fee. Um, that there will be committees set up on each campus which students will participate in that will determine um, how that fee will be used at each campus. You know, each of our campuses are unique. Um, some of them have currently have greater capacity for mental and physical um, health and wellness programs. And so they might want to use the funds in a different way than colleges who haven't had that capacity. And so we want each college to create their own unique um, use of those funds. There will be a portion of the funds that we will set aside um, that will be determined um, by the university how much each campus will receive. And again, that'll be based on creating some minimum standards at each campus. For example, um, there'll be minimum standards that'll be created for how many mental health counselors each campus much ha must have. So some might meet that already, um, some might fall short, and so those colleges that are falling short might get uh, more of that allocation in order to, to get up to that, that standard. 
Um, but this is in response to um, what we've been hearing from, from our students in terms of um, their concerns and investments that they'd like to see made in our campuses for additional health and wellness services. And so, um, you know, as you mentioned, Chair Barron, we are planning to implement that beginning with the fall 21, uh, the fall 20, I should say, semester. Is there a standard ratio uh, that, the co that CUNY has for the number of mental health counselors based on the number of students? Is there some formula that's, being, that's trying to be achieved? Um, there's not a current one, but um, as part of implementing the health and wellness fee, we will be setting a minimum standard that each college must have in terms of mental health counselors. Um, I don't know what that number will be just yet. We are working on that, but there will be a minimum standard that will be established. And you indicated that uh, it would be approximately a little less than $30 million. University-wide, University-wide. Can you give us the d distinction for the community colleges? What would that amount be? About $9 million for the community colleges of the 30. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm going to take a break, and I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Council, Council Member Brad Lander, to pose his questions, and then I'll be back. And I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council <coughs> Member Rodriguez as well, a member of the committee. Thank you uh, very much, Chair Barron, for this hearing, and in general for your leadership on this committee. And thank you to the uh, reps from CUNY. I'm, I'm not a <coughs> member of the committee, but I wanted to come today because um, I really share and believe in the, uh, the fact that CUNY is just an extraordinary vehicle of upward social mobility uh, in New York City. Um, <clears throat> the chair is right to raise, of course, all the concerns and questions that we need to, but big picture, I think you know, we all agree in principle <clears throat> that CUNY is just doing something extraordinary as a vehicle for fulfilling our vision of an inclusive, genuinely equal, multiracial democracy in New York City in a way when so many other places in our housing, in so many other of our education outcomes, in our employment, we don't, we don't come close to, to delivering it. So, um, and I don't, you know, we don't reflect that enough in what we contribute from the state or the city to make it possible for CUNY to do its work. This administration, uh, in partnership with this council and with pushing through the chair and this committee, have done better than before, but I still think we fall woefully short. And I've been trying to think about what some ways we could address that were. And so I was struck recently when the New York City uh, Property Tax Commission that the council and the mayor set up as they started to dig into various different kinds of property tax inequities, and we're looking at homeowners mostly, but they did kind of in one of their back tables bury this question about um, private higher education tax breaks and pilots which struck me as we're thinking about tax inequities and how we could move toward more equality as one we should uh, interrogate. So I wanted to come today and just ask you a few questions about it. And I'll start by noticing, by noting with congratulations that six of the top 10 schools on CollegeNet's social mobility index are CUNY campuses. I wonder, do you want to venture a guess at where NYU or Columbia fall on the CollegeNet social mobility index? I'm not aware of that, but you think I, it's above or below 100? <laughs> above uh, or below 500? Yeah, that, no. That I, I, I'm not, I don't mean above or below 1,000. May I just answer that? You think they're above or below 1,000? You got six of the top 10. What, what do you think? NYU and Columbia are above or above or below 1,000 on the social mobility uh, index? It, it could be around there. I'm not real sure, but I, Councilman Lander, I, I very much appreciate your. L your, your kind words about CUNY, I totally agree with you. It's an amazing place. So, uh, uh, let me just go a little further, and I, I'm going to ask you them as questions, but obviously only on the CUNY answers am I going to expect you to have answers. I'll, I'll provide the Columbia and NYU thank answers. Thank you. I, I NYU, appreciate the expectation. <laughs> NYU is 1,303. Okay. And Columbia is 1,363. Interesting. Uh, thank you. There are schools worse than that. But, um, uh, and you said the tuition at CUNY is how much on average? At the senior colleges, it's uh, for residents, New York State resident student, it's six thousand nine hundred thirty dollars. All right. Year. Do you know what the NYU or Columbia tuitions are? I do not, but I would imagine our six thousand nine hundred thirty dollars <laughs> a year would get you through maybe Columbus Day. <laughs> NYU's is fifty one thousand eight twenty eight, and Columbia's is fifty nine four thirty. What's the median income of a CUNY student to the to the best of your you know what that? 
Um, I don't know that, but I can tell you that um, I can tell you that a, a large portion of our students, I don't have the data with me, um, families come from incomes less than $30,000 a year. A large uh, you know, what I saw on City College's website was a median income of about 40000 Just for comparison, the median income of families at NYU is 149300 and at Columbia, 150000 And again, those are great schools. They're just not vehicles of upward social mobility. They're vehicles of reproducing the privilege that, that folks already have. Um, it, um, what percent of students at, across CUNY campuses, to your best of your knowledge, are, are uh, African American or, Lat or Latino? I have that data. And um, again, we're very proud that CUNY reflects the, the, um, the demographics of our city. Um, so at our, um, But thank you. Um, so at our senior colleges, it's 23.9% uh, black, 27.9% Latino, 24.2% Asian, 23.7% white, 0.3% um, Native American. And our community colleges, 28.2% black, 39.5% Latino, 16.9% Asian, 15% white, 0.4% Native American. And do you want to? Can you repeat that number? Sure. Community colleges? Oh, both. Okay. Senior college is 23.9% black, 27.9% Latino, 24.2% Asian, 23.7% white, 0.3% Native American. Community colleges, 28.2% black, 39.5% Latino, 16.9% Asian, 15% white, 0.4% Native American. And do you want to venture a guess at what percent of either NYU or Columbia students are black or Latino? I would not like to venture. All right, well, I'll tell you, luckily. At NYU, it's about 6% black, about 11% Latino, and at Columbia, 5% black and 8% Latino. Again, and look, I'm a, myself a graduate of a private university of higher education, not one of those. So, uh, you know, I just, I think it's worth pointing out as we think about where resources will come from just in how profoundly CUNY reflects the diversity of our city and is an engine of upward social mobility for people like all the young people of New York City. And NYU and Columbia, the marvelous institutions in many ways, do not reflect the young people of New York City, and they are not vehicles for upward social mobility. Um, so um, I guess just one last question on this front. What's, what's CUNY's endowment? Mm -hmm. um, we. CUNY has a, what we call our investment pool that um, colleges um, can contribute to. The investment pool currently is about 290 million. Um, 290 million. 290 million in okay. the CUNY investment pool. Do you want to you want to venture a guess at what the NYU and Columbia endowments are? Probably in the billions. NYU has a $4.35 billion endowment and Columbia a $10.9 billion endowment. So this kind of brings me to my point, because as a result of state law, not city law, uh, institutions of private higher education in New York essentially, for the most part, receive an exemption from real estate taxes. If you own commercial property or fee-paying parking lots, you can pay a little bit. But for the most part, um, institutions of private higher education do not pay taxes um, in New York City. And, and the IBO estimates the value of the tax break for all private higher education, this is not just those two institutions, is $483 million a year that New York City does not collect in real estate taxes because of that tax break. Um, in Boston, some private universities make voluntary payments in lieu of taxes, and in Connecticut law actually mandates that the state provide municipalities 77% uh, of what's foregone by private universities. So it, it just occurs to me as we looked at the Property Tax Commission report um, that maybe Columbia and NYU, given the profiles that we've discussed here, um, should be paying 77%, 50%, some percent of the real estate taxes that New York City is foregoing, and that we could dedicate that money to CUNY to help address the new needs you were discussing. You know, we could do that. That 77 million you were seeking from the city uh, would be, you know, less than 20% of the 
value of the tax break we're foregoing. Is this something that, that CUNY has looked at or had conversations with any of its peer institutions? Uh, that's about? not something that we've specifically looked at, but, um, but again, any way that the city can generate more revenues that could be dedicated to CUNY, we would definitely appreciate. And Councilmember Lander, if I can, I just want to take one minute to, to tout a recent um, a, a study that was done at two of our campuses. So City College and Queens College both um, um, commissioned a study with a firm called um, MC, which is a labor analytics, um, which is a company that does labor analytics. And um, interestingly, it found that um, City College provides about 1.9 billion to New York's economy, and Queens College provides about 1.8 billion. And again, as a finance person, and return on investment is, is an important component that I like to look at. Um, they found that City and Queens College, for every dollar that New York invests in City and, and in Queens College, they get somewhere between three and five dollars back. Um, so any investment in CUNY is a well um, is a, is a good investment in. New York State and New York City. Amen. So um, I'll, I'll, I have one more line of questioning, but I'll leave this one here. I'll just say, um, Chair, you know, maybe we could look at dig in on this a little more deeply. Talk to some of the City Council staff who worked on that property tax commission report. Maybe there's some students or professors at CUNY that could help us dig in here. But it seems to me, given that tax inequity and the social mobility differences, um, that this might, and we would need help from our friends at the state level because it's a state tax exemption, um, but it, it might be one that it's come time to look at if we want to <coughs> live up to the commitments to social mobility. And that's not to take anything away from the chair's other questions. So I do just, though, um, want to drill down a little on the chair's questions about um, Hunter uh, yeah. High School and, and, and elementary and middle school as well, because while at the higher ed level, CUNY is an extraordinary vehicle of upward social mobility that reflects the diversity of the city, um, Hunter Elementary, Middle, and High School r really is, is not. Um, and you mentioned before you kind of compared it to the New York City specialized high schools like Stuyvesant and, and Brooklyn Tech, um, uh, which have been rightly in the news for just how few black and, and Latino students they have. I guess it, it doesn't sound like you have, that CUNY has focused on asking the questions yet of Hunter about where it sits of the kind that the chair was asking? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, again, I, I will, I will speak to the folks at Hunter and, and folks in our um, uh, in academic affairs to find out more information on that. Okay, so I, I have a little more information and I, I think it'll distress you to learn that actually Hunter is, is substantially worse than the specialized high schools mm -hmm. on diversity measures. And those specialized high schools are already terrible from the point of view of not having black and Latino students represented in anything like they are uh, in, New York, in New York City. But um, Hunter, at least according to the data that, that I have, is, is actually worse. Um, in the 2019-2020 school year, only 2.4% black students and only 6.2% Latinx students compared with 25.5% black and 40.6% black of the New York City school population. And one thing that is distressing and I think telling is that the specialized high schools actually at least have a reasonable percentage of students eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, they have a lot of low-income students, so that figure is 42% at Sty, 59% at Brooklyn Tech, and 42% at Brock Science. It's only 9% of Hunter's 7th to 12th graders, according to the available public information. So um, I guess I'm going to ask, in addition to not just will you get the data and give it to the chair, but will you join the chair and me in, in focusing on this question and um, taking steps together to make sure that we make Hunter reflect the CUNY mission. This is not somebody else's mission here. I, I don't know what Stuyvesant High School's mission is other than Stuyvesant High School, but, 
like CUNY has a mission so well reflected in what City College and Hunter College and, and, and Brooklyn College are. You know that the best and the brightest are young people of color and low-income students. So we would, I, I would assume we want to reflect that as well in, in places like the elementary, middle, and, and high schools that you operate. So I guess I would just ask, you, you made a commitment to the chair to get the data, mm -hmm. but will you make a commitment to work with us to call attention to and push and start to make some improvements here as well? Well, I'll, I'll make a commitment to um, bringing this concern back to my principals, to the chancellor and others in the administration, and to the president of Hunter College, um, and you know, make sure that uh, they know of the concern of the council, and certainly we'll get you the information that you've Great. requested. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, the co my colleague has talked about uh, the great standing that CUNY has in terms of being an, an institution for upward social mobility and talked about the demographics of those students at CUNY. But if we can bring up the uh, chart about the demographic disparity between the instructional staff and students. So we can see that 29% of the student population is black and only 19% is reflected in the staff as being black. For Asian and Pacific Islander, it's 17% of the student population and only 12% of the staffing. For whites, it's 15%, yet it's 54% of the staff. And for Latinx, it was 38% student population and only 15% of the staff. So this is an issue which I've addressed, brought to CUNY's attention since I've been the chair. And there has not been movement of any uh, significance in this regard. And even in CUNY's uh, master plan, it was noted as an item to be addressed in the previous master plan and is also noted in this master plan as an item to be addressed without reflecting on any success in the prior master plan without any evaluation of what happened in the previous so-called master plan. So how does CUNY attend to rectify this inequity? Well, I know that um, our, this is a uh, very important topic that the chancellor is very committed to. As you know, he's, he's the first person of color to be chancellor of this university. I think when you look at his, um, at the folks that he has brought into um, the executive positions at the university, um, they're all people from uh, folks that represent minority groups. Alan Liu, good example, first Asian American uh, Vice Chancellor here at CUNY, his presidential appointments as well. So this is an important topic to him, not only for the executive positions, but also for the faculty. Um, Two things I'll just mention real quick um, is that when you look at that chart, and I agree with your concerns, Chair Barron, is, but when you look at those numbers um, and compare them nationally, um, we, are, we are one of the highest in but terms But we don't of want to compare them nationally. We want to compare them to other similar uh, large cities with similar populations. Because if you look at it nationally, we look great. But when we go to smaller communities, which are part of that national assessment, that, that skews what it is that we're looking at in a large urban population. No, understood. And the, the other thing I just want to mention is something I brought up at the hearing that uh, we had in, in late January on the, on the adjuncts. And again, um, whether it's significant uh, movement, we can, we can discuss, but it, I, just one point I want to um, mention that I think is an encouraging data element is that in 2014, the percentage of new faculty hires um, that were black was 6.2% and that were Latino was 8.2%. But in 2019, for, black, uh, for new hires that were black, it was 12% and for Latino it was 13.5%. So we are showing some progress there. Um, we know we have a lot more to do to address this situation. And I know that our chancellor and our board um, and all of us at the university are committed to, to 
um, improving the, these numbers? Well, those numbers that you cited are from 2014 and 2019. Correct. But if we go back 50 years, if we go back to the 1970s, it was much higher then than what it is now, much higher then than what it is now. So we've got to really look at how we can get back to a better reflection of uh, matching what it is that we have the student populations with the faculty. I do have a few more questions I want to get onto the record. <clears throat> Regarding the Census 2020, mm -hmm. uh, the fiscal 2020 budget included one-time various intra-city transfers totaling $108 million added for student internship, fellowship and training, in partnership with other city agencies. In December 2019, CUNY was allocated $19 million to serve as key programmatic and administrative partner in the city's get out the count effort headed ahead of this year's decentennial census. $16 million for the purpose of funding 157 community-based organizations, and I did have concerns about how those organizations were selected to perform census outreach, and $3 million to cover CUNY's administrative costs. CUNY also created the CUNY Census Corps, comprised of 200 students in order to assist in census field activities. So the questions are, how will CUNY be monitoring the deliverables of community-based organizations awarded funding from the Complete Count Fund? And as part of the follow-up for this hearing, can CUNY provide the council finalized scopes of work and funding amounts for the Complete Count Fund awardees? Sure. Well, uh, to your second question, Chair Brown, yes, we can, uh, we can provide the finalized scopes of work and the individual amounts that went to those um, CBOs that you cited earlier. So we will, we will get you that information. Um, we're really excited about this initiative and we're very grateful for the, for the funding that we received for this. Um, as you mentioned, we have 230 students that are, that are participating in, in what we call the CUNY Census Corps. Um, about 70% of these students speak a language other than English and that covers 44 languages um, and so again, we're really excited about that because these students are gonna play a key role mm -hmm. in getting the word out to um, the communities throughout New York City and, and helping um, with um, people whose Eng English is not their first language. So we're excited about helping New York City and our students getting terrific experience as part of working in the CUNY Census Corps. Um, this was a, um, a collaboration between uh, the New York City Census 2020 um, organization and CUNY um, in terms of reviewing the um, applications from the CBOs and selecting the ones that that were selected um, our Office of Academic Affairs at the CUNY system administration is um, administering this and is managing this um, with the New York City Census uh, 2020 organization as well so um, again we will get you the finalized scopes of work and um, the the final budgets for those CBOs and get you whatever additional information you would like. But again, we're very grateful for the allocation and so is for there the opportunity for our students to participate. Thank you. How is there a person whose responsibility it is to actually monitor it, the deliverables as the process is being undertaken? Yes, um, our Office of Academic Affairs is um, is administering this. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, we don't have anyone here today that. Um, is part of that uh, okay. group, but, um, but yes, there are folks in uh, academic affairs at the central office that are, that are monitoring and managing this and, um, and liaisoning with all of the campuses. As you talked about uh, selecting, involving students who speak a, a variety of languages, I think you said 44 languages, that's certainly critical because we wanna make sure that we can get uh, a more reflective count. And in certain communities, there's also a fear or distrust of persons who are not within the community to share this information or to perhaps uh, not respond. And my concern is that there perhaps should have been a factor in the criteria that was used to judge the applicants that would reflect those organizations and CBOs 
that are already operating in the community and that have what's called credibility in the community to encourage people to complete the census. And I've been told, well, they can be subcontracted and they can be employed, but I think that perhaps that should have been a factor uh, that should have been considered in making the decision as to what organizations. Uh, but would you also, we would like to have CUNY provide a breakdown of how they allocated the $3 million to cover administrative costs, mm -hmm. as well as a breakdown of any associated headcount and a status update on the CUNY Census Corps. Mm -hmm. Is it fully staffed? Are there any vacancies? And how have its members been incorporated into get out the count activities? We'll get you all that information. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next set of questions is about mental health support. The second largest intra-city transfer allocated $17.7 .7 million transferred from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, for the Mental Health Service Corps at Hunter College. Mm -hmm. In fiscal 2014, 45 million was transferred from DOHMH to Hunter College for this program. Did this program end in December 2019? Um, yes, Chair Brown, that, that program is ending. I'm not sure if December 2019 was the end date or not, um, but you know we'll find out for you, but that program is ending at Hunter And College. is H&H &H taking over that program? Uh, and if so, what part will CUNY play in the program? I'm not certain who's taking it over. We were you know, informed that that allocation you know, would not be recurring and that program was phasing out at Hunter College. So I'm not certain of what um, what the future is in terms of that specific program. And what substitute programming is there then available to the students in CUNY uh, if CUNY is no longer engaging in this program? Well, all, all of our campuses have uh, varying um, degrees of um, supports on mental health um, and have their own individual programs. Um, so. There are programs at, at each of the campuses um, on mental health supports, um, but there's not one thing that's going to replace that program. You know, that was part of um, you know, the Thrive Initiative, and Hunter College you know, was happy to participate in it. Um, but again, we were informed that that program would be, would be phasing out at Hunter College. Okay, uh, moving to the ACS Workforce Institute. The third largest intra-city transfer total, $15.9 million, and it was added in November 2019 fiscal plan from ACS in collaboration with the ACS Workforce Initiative and the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Yep. Can CUNY confirm if ACS intends to allow any contracted agency staff uh, to train at the Workforce Institute? Yes, that's my understanding of, of how the program works, um, but we will confirm, um, but that is my understanding. And again, we're very, we're very excited about this program and the collaboration with ACS. Um, I, I want to point out that School of Professional Studies is the main um, relationship there from CUNY, but that the Hunter College Silberman School of Social Work is also involved in this as well. Um, and again, it's providing, I think, a wonderful opportunity to the staff at ACS to um, get additional um, academic um, and educational credits in higher ed um, through SPS and, and through Hunter. And how many training sessions will be conducted over the course of the fiscal year? Because CUNY, we know, has a historical relationship with other CUNY agencies and providing services in partnership for the program. So what new programs are on the horizon that we can look forward to? Um, not, not aware of any new programs, but as you mentioned earlier, Chair Barron, um, we are um, the, the go-to agency amongst in, in city government because we are a university mm -hmm. um, for training type programs. And so, um, as you mentioned, our intra-city um, revenue budget is usually around $100 million a year because we are providing you know, many services um, to various agencies in terms of training. Um, so not aware of any new programs that are on the horizon, but, um, but we are doing um, you know, a robust uh, training throughout the year through, for many agencies. Um, and it, and in addition to the one you mentioned for ACS. And, and do you have the number of training sessions that will be conducted 
over the course of the fiscal year for the uh, program, the ACS Workforce Initiative? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I don't, but we will, we will get that. We'll speak to the School Professional Studies in Hunter and get you that information. Okay. I'm going to take a break here and allow my colleague to ask questions. Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. I, I think that, as you say, not only we've been repeating the same description of the challenges that we have you know, at CUNY on the youth side as a chair, but I'm pretty sure the same challenge that we have when I used to be a chair, and even when your great partner, Councilmember Byron, used to be a chair too. You know, when we look at lack of diversity, it's like we don't wake up. And I think that at some point, it's like the Me Too movement. You know, I think that the city is only ready to respond when there's like an outrage outside there of people who mobilize and use all the tools to challenge the status quo and even to challenge our progressive country in the <coughs> city of New York. That is happening on the watch. It's like now we know that there's a crisis in NYCHA, but everyone has seen that situation in the 80s and the 90s. Now it became to the new, make it to the news and when everyone is addressing. I think that when we look at our realities, everything's about the pipeline. The challenge is that we don't want to share the privilege. I always say that if you have the public school, the middle class and upper class, that's a pipeline. If you say, I went to this public school and I'm a lawyer, you are a doctor, my child goes to this public school, most likely you are, you are talking about a public school that is completely different than the public school that they have 25% of the students living in supporting housing. Different from the other a school that the student they come in October over the county and the DOE is not adding new resources to the principal, neither CUNY has a plan on how to connect it. We're lacking a pre-K to college comprehensive program. That's if at some point we need to address, how did it happen? I, was, I went to City College in 1988. There was around at that time, most of the students, close to 75% or more, they were Latin, black and Latinos. So from the 80 to today, the diversity of the city is even higher. 29% Latino, 27% African American, and then we are not able to translate that diversity. And instead of continue growing senior colleges, it is a shame. And it's not shame to an individual. It's a shame to the city of New York, to the public and private sector, that we have seen a reduction in senior colleges big time when it came to black and Latino. Who's taking responsibility for that? Who's saying that's happening in my watch? Who's saying we're lacking that project? I know that when we get as a council member, as a staff, and you guys get a talking point, and we don't want to challenge sister agency. But what is the DOE doing? What is CUNY doing? What is the state doing? A student at Sophie David in the city college school engineer cost double than the student who graduated like myself in political science. When will Albany be ready to match the spends of those senior colleges? When will we, the senior colleges, Hunter, City, Baru, Brooklyn, the tier one, will put together a better plan, a pipeline to go down the body I was a student at Luperon High School for 13 years. And we know that City College did a great project. For many times, students, they were applying to City College, and they were denied. They were sent to Community College. And the admission office at City College, they did a pilot project. And they accept an average group of students who, under circumstances, they will be denied 
at a senior college and be sent to a, CUNY, to a community college. Most of them graduated with an average of three. Let's replicate those pilot projects. Let's only stop using the SAT to take kids to Hunter College, to City, to the Tier 1. If we don't do something about it, students will take the street on this issue too. 2020, and it's happening under our watch, but you know what happened? That people, they don't want to share the privilege. So pipeline to take it from pre-K to college is necessary. Let me tell you one thing that I did. 1992, Professor Joseph Barber, the former dean of the School of Engineers, he got some funding for the NASA, and he created a STEM Institute. His vision was to connect on the circuit in the STEM field. However, in the last six years, the program had been doing so well that a student been applying not only from the average high school, but from the Bronx sign, from establishment, from Jersey, from Connecticut. We sat down. I guarantee a million dollar in perpetuity for the STEM Institute to be expanded to the surrounding school and we lowered to middle school. So for me, we there, we here to be for CUNY, but the private sector and the public sector have to step in and recognize this as a crisis. Great to see new leadership at CUNY today. And I know that they have a big heart. But those people here in Wall Street, they don't care. Those who raise a big, huge amount of money in other places, they don't care. Why Amazon? did not come out and sit with CUNY as a, as a first partner. If Amazon will come to the city in York and they will say, we are planning to come here and 50% of the job will be created and trained by CUNY, I don't think that the support will not be there. But when they started with the big one, the Columbia or the NYU, and then let's bring, corner, let's bring CUNY to show that they also included then we're failing in that part. So for me, it's about, I'm ready to be working with the chair. You know, we really care for this, but the lack of diversity. You know, the hiring committee in each college has to reflect the diversity, starting there. There's no diversity in those hiring committee, in any in, in of those colleges. Look at the provost. Look at the leadership. There's a crisis at that level. Let's just start recruiting students since they are freshmen in the first semester. And let's take them to offer for them to look at themselves as a PhD candidate from freshmen to when they finish. And let's raise the money. And let's connect them with the position. Let's not be afraid. We want to celebrate Martin Luther King of those leaders in January. Let's lead by example. And I have a lot of concern about how one more time it's a dancing boy cycle and we see the same number, and this number is a shame. Uh, thank you, council member. Uh, I want to talk now about the state budget issues, the community college base aid. The governor's executive budget proposes to hold the base aid to $223 million for fiscal 2021, but <clears throat> it is good to hear more deals, details from CUNY on this issue. If this base aid were increased, what might occur for students at CUNY? And would this pending tuition increase still occur? You know, thank you for raising this issue, Chair Barron. So the governor's executive proposal, as you mentioned, kept base aid flat at the current year's level, which is $2,947 per student, full-time equivalent. This has been the case in the last several years that the executive proposal keeps base aid flat, and we have been fortunate, we're very grateful that in the final enacted budget, the Senate and Assembly and the governor have been able to come to an agreement to increase that over the last several years. But one of the concerns that we have about um, keeping it flat is that community college enrollment has been down the last several years, um, has been down throughout New York State um, at SUNY and at CUNY, and so we've had, had some enrollment decline. So if 
Community, if the base aid number remains flat, we're gonna get, we're gonna receive less state aid next year and we're projecting that's gonna be about $5.4 million. Um, so we are seeking a, a increase to community college base aid. Our budget request includes an increase of $250 per student. Um, and $250 per student would not only make up for the enrollment losses, but also allow um, some additional funding for investments at our community colleges as well. So um, we have been talking to the Senate and Assembly about that as part of our state lobbying efforts, and we're optimistic that when the final state budget is announced uh, close to April 1st, that uh, we will have an increase in the, in the base aid amount for next year. So we talk about the $250 increase uh, that you're requesting. How much would this $250 increase equate to? What is that total? 12, about $12 million. Approximately $12 million. Mm -hmm. okay. And if CUNY were to receive this increase in funding, what additional services would be included? Um, I think that would be something that each individual college would determine on their own if we're fortunate enough to get a 250 base aid increase. Um, I think um, that'll be part of what we allocate to the colleges. Um, and I think we would have a specific, um, again, prescription to each college is what the money must be used for. I think um, every college will make that determination based on, on their needs and, and their enrollment patterns. And if CUNY does not receive this increase, what is your contingency plan? Well, we're concerned. I mean, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have a $6 million efficiencies target from the city for FY21, um, which you know, we're hoping will, will not increase as part of the executive or adopted budget conditions with the city. So we have a $6 million efficiencies target from the city. And um, if, again, if base aid remains flat in the state, aside, that's a $5.4 million loss in state aid. So we would be looking at $11.4 million overall that we would have to reduce our community college budgets by. Of course, as we, as we do every year when we have efficiencies targets, we always look for ways that we can offset that um, in areas outside of the college budgets. But for the most part, that would have to be reductions from the college's budgets. Would that then mean that where there are vacancies that exist, those vacancies would not be filled? I think that um, if colleges are looking at um, reductions of that size, that that would be a tool that most colleges would employ to help meet that target. They would not fill vacancies. I think um, most colleges, when they're in that situation, try to keep those, um, those vacancies not being filled on the administrative side and not on the faculty side. but. Um, but for some colleges, it could be a case where um, they would have to do that on the faculty side as well, depending on the level of reduction that they have to make. Moving on to the TAP gap. The TAP gap refers to the difference between a student's TAP grant and her tuition charges. Historically, CUNY has to cover this gap, and we are interested to hear more on this topic. If the state does not come in and fill this gap, estimated at $79 million. CUNY has requested $8 million a year for the next four years from the state to help cover the difference between the maximum TAP award and the tuition rate. What is CUNY's plan to fill the gap? Mm -hmm. So um, as you mentioned, Chair Barron, TAP gap refers to the amount, the difference between the maximum TAP award, which is $5,165, and CUNY's tuition rate. So for community colleges, there is no TAP gap, right? because we're, we're below, we're at 4,800. But for senior colleges, there is, and as you mentioned, it's $78 million in the current year. Um, and so as, as you referenced, in our budget request, we are requesting $8 million a year for the next four years to help close the gap. We know 78 million is a big number to close in any one year, and so we wanna, we're basically requesting to see progress towards, towards helping to close that. Um, so again, we are in discussions with folks in Albany, um, at all, in all three houses, Executive, Assembly, Senate, and we are optimistic that, um, that when the final budget is enacted um, on April 1st, that there will be some relief towards that TAP gap for our senior colleges. When was the last time that the TAP ceiling was raised? And um, does CUNY anticipate that this ceiling will move anytime soon? I say you, you're hopeful, is that based on 
any kind of concrete evidence that it would? Um, it's based on discussions. The last time it was raised to 5,065, it's been several years. It's been maybe five years or so. How? 2015, thank you, Elaine. 2015 was the last time it was raised to, to 5,165 from 5,000. Um, so whether it's raising the maximum award, which, which you know, we, would, we would support, or it's providing funds to CUNY and to SUNY to help, help close the tap gap, um, whatever way the state decides that they can manage that, um, we, would, you know, we would be pleased with any, any additional support that we can receive to help close that tap gap. Uh, you talked about the decline in freshman enrollment. So the enrollment of first-time freshmen at CUNY Community Colleges who are recent graduates of New York City Public Schools has gone down. In FY16, it was 13,769, and in FY19, 12,916. Do you have any information or any data that explains that drop? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just clarify that um, new freshman enrollment at the entire university, senior colleges and community colleges, ha actually has been increasing. And this past year for fall 2019 semester, we enrolled over 40,000 new freshmen, which was a record at the university, the highest we've ever had in terms of new freshmen. So new freshmen are still coming, which is, which is a great sign. Um, Part of the reason why overall enrollment is down is we, we've also been successful on the back end in terms of graduating more students. Last year we graduated almost 55,000 students, which again was, was a record at the university. Um, but for community colleges in particular, the issue really has been, um, we believe, related to the economy. Uh, because the economy here in New York is doing so well, um, we believe that's the main factor in why community college enrollment is down. And we, we went back and looked at this over 30 years. Um, when you look at the New York City unemployment rate and community college enrollment at CUNY, there's a direct relationship. When the unemployment rate is very low, community college enrollment goes down. When the unemployment rate is high, people are out of work and, and are looking to um, get additional skills or get an associate's degree to help them um, seek, seek a, uh, a position, community college enrollment goes up. At, after the recession in 2008, 2009, 2012, we had a surge in community college enrollment. So that, we believe, is the main factor in why community college enrollment's been slipping the last several years. So you're saying that the economy has a great impact on enrollment at the community colleges rather than at the senior Correct. colleges? Correct. Overall um, enrollment at the senior colleges has actually been up um, the last few years, um, but community college enrollment, it's been, it's been down. I think um, it's been down, I think, four years in a row now. Okay. I want to ask some questions about the Research Foundation. <clears throat> in fiscal 2017, the Research Foundation reported over 14,800 full and part-time employees. Of these employees, how many are full-time and how many are part-time? Um, I don't have that information, but um, you know, on the Research Foundation, there are folks who um, work at the Research Foundation who are full-time employees. <clears throat> there are also folks who work at our campuses in research activities who are considered employees of the Research Foundation. <clears throat> in terms of the part-time staff, um, there are a lot of um, students who are hired um, to work on research projects that could be considered part-time staff. So I don't have the breakdown, um, but we will get that from the Research Foundation and, and get that information to you. So of the full-time and part-time employees of the Research Foundation, some of those employees, in fact, work for CUNY? Um, well, they're, they're considered employees of the Research Foundation. Um, but I would say the majority of them work at our campuses. Um, there are several hundred that work in the, you know, the headquarters of the CUNY Research Foundation who actually do the grant administration, but the majority of those people are Research Foundation employees who work on our campuses. So if you could get us that information, the breakdown of uh, full-time, part-time, and where, in fact, they are working yes. uh, and how many that is. And the other question we have, we would like to know how many employees bridge both the Research Foundation and CUNY. Okay, we will, we will get you all that information. 
talking now about CUNY's <coughs> sorry, preliminary capital commitment plan, the fiscal 2010 through 2024 preliminary capital commitment plan declined slightly by $14.2 million compared to the adopted capital plan totaling $615.8 million. How many projects does this include? We have um, altogether, um, in terms of new projects, we have 200 projects, uh, large and small, under design. We could provide you with the list. Okay. And did you talk about how many projects you anticipate completing this year? Did you um, mention that? Yeah, this, the, uh, there's a list of uh, uh, completed projects in the capital request book from last year. It's on page 185 like almost the last page of the book. You can see the list there, or we can send it to you. And how many new projects do you anticipate starting this year? Um, I said that we have new projects that were 200 projects, and uh, we have um, um, okay. So uh, new projects would be really the projects that are under in design, uh, the, the 200 number that I, I mentioned before. In design? Yeah. Okay. I had asked many, many, many hearings ago for CUNY to let me know what is the value of the assets that they hold. Do we have that number yet? The value of the assets? Right. Which are the buildings that you own? So um, I know you lease some buildings. Yeah, I think was it ninety? Is it close to ninety? Yeah. Um, rough, rough value. They said thirty billion without the land. Thirty billion without the land. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, project prioritization. CUNY relies on 100 buildings to support students across its seven community colleges, and the average age of these buildings is more than 50 years, while many buildings are closer to 100 years old. How does CUNY prioritize its capital spending? So, um, my office works uh, work, uh, collaboratively uh, with the CUNY's uh, 25 schools and colleges. Staff are dedicated to each college, and they work with the vice presidents and the facility staff at the college level. Uh, to understand the campus needs and then to define projects uh, to respond to those needs. Uh, in addition, as part of our annual capital request process, we complete a comprehensive review of each college's capital program. The budget and planning and design staff um, meet with uh, campus vice presidents and facility staff to priori prioritize those funding requests with emphasis on securing funding to complete projects that are already in process as well as to make sure the most pressing needs are being addressed. Recently, we have begun linking our state of good repair data to our capital request program, uh, helping to make sure that we are addressing all aspects of the campus's infrastructure needs. So do you have a list in order of, okay, this is the first project, this is the next, uh, and if you do, where on that list is uh, Kingsborough Community College. I've been there and their library is really uh, really in need of major capital repairs. So, so this, this book um, uh, really lays out all of the needs and, uh, for each of the colleges and all the community colleges. Mm -hmm. And it actually gets into the weeds and the bushes in terms of the particular uh, uh, you know, projects whether it's infrastructure or whether it's related to, uh, you know, classrooms and laboratories. Right. So I understand that that's a compilation of all of the needs. Uh, is there a list that says, okay, this is number one, this is number two, number three, number four? Yep. Okay. Why don't, why don't we... Why don't I get that back to you? you know? Okay. Okay. And, and we would like to have a copy of the document that you're holding up. That so book, that you we don't have that? We haven't received it. Council has said they haven't received it. So we would like to. No, no, you can stay seated. The sergeant will get it for you. Sergeant at arms, we want you to be comfortable. Thank you. Focus on our questions. <laughs> we don't want to disturb you. 
Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to find out how the, how, how the list, if there is such a list, is prioritized and where on the list can I find Kingsborough Community College with their request? Um, there's a section for King Kingsborough. There's a section and it's enumerated? Huh? Number one. Number one? Number one. Okay, we'll look at that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I have a few more questions going back to the Research Foundation. Uh, I understand that the Research Foundation's role has changed in light of the financial problems that it faced in 2016. Can you give me an update on the Research Foundation's new role? Well, I would say their role hasn't really changed overall. Okay. And, and let me just give you a brief description of the Research Foundation, why it exists and what it does. Okay. Um, so the Research Foundation is a, a separately incorporated non-for-profit. It's, it's a 501c3. Um, it exists to, on behalf of CUNY to serve the university, um, but it is a separate organization. And really what it does is, you know, a lot of people talk about efficiencies and shared services, and, and I like to describe the Research Foundation as one of the best examples of a shared service in that um, all of the research activity that are being generated by our faculty from mostly the federal government, but also from the city and the state as well, the Research Foundation is administering all of these grants. Um, so each, co it, it, for in other words, if we, if we got rid of the Research Foundation, we would have to expend a lot more money for each college to administer their own grants. So the fact that we have one organization that administers all of the grants um, for um, the uh, colleges um, is a really efficient way of doing it. Um, all of our colleges rely on the Research Foundation greatly um, for grant activity. I think we usually generate between 300 and 400 million dollars in grant activity a year. Um, and so the Research Foundation provides a really valuable resource to us. Um, so I don't know if their role is changing so much, um, but, um, but again, they, they do provide a valuable resource and um, something that our colleges uh, you know, greatly rely on and work very closely with throughout the year. Um, what mechanisms have been put in place so that uh, CUNY and the Research Foundation can ensure that the, quote, overhead funds aren't abused as they were in 2016? Yeah, and again, I don't, I, I don't you know, I, I wouldn't use the term that overhead funds were abused, but, okay. um, but what's in place is that, and let me again back up and say what overhead funds are. So on each grant, so faculty members get a grant from the National Institute of Health, or National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. um, and there's an amount that um, is that the federal government allows us to right. charge for overhead costs. They really go back to the college to cover those overhead costs. Um, so uh, those are, um, you know, again administered and monitored through the Research Foundation. Um, each college decides how best to use those um, overhead costs. We do have to report them back to um, the granting agency, again, whether it's NIH or NSF or whoever the granting agency is, so we do have to report those um, as well. The Research Foundation also um, is responsible for issuing um, financial statement, audited financial statements, um, which they do every year, um, and CUNY's financial statements that we issue every year that, again, externally audited <coughs> and that we do bring to our board audit committee um, are what we call comprehensive, or we, I should say consolidated financial statements, because we include the RF's activity within the CUNY's consolidated financial statements as well. So um, there is a lot of monitoring, there's a lot of auditing and um, of all the expenditures that go through the Research Foundation. So I had hoped to have had a hearing, particularly on the Research Foundation, and we expect that we will have that hearing uh, sometime as soon as possible. And will, at that point, uh, CUNY be able to answer as to, I was told that they're still shaping how this foundation is going to proceed and move forward. So 
Are well, you just yeah, about I think, and, and we'll be able to answer all of those concerns, at, or all those questions, I should say, at the hearing. I mean, right now, um, the Research Foundation is under interim leadership, and so, um, you know, when there is permanent leadership there, there, there could be some changes, and obviously with, a, with our new chancellor and new provost, um, again, there could be uh, a change in direction, but their overall function will continue to be grant administration as it has been for um, over 50 years. Okay, um, I think that concludes my questions. I thank you for your presentation. You. And if there are other questions that I have overlooked or forgotten, we will submit them to you and ask that you respond. Thank you for your time. Thank you once again for coming and for thank sharing. You. Okay. Who else is here Who, besides? Uh, we do want to acknowledge that we normally do receive this document that you presented today. We want to acknowledge that we do normally receive it and uh, just hadn't gotten it yet, but thank you so much. Okay, we have two panels, and the first panel that I'm going to call is the USS panel. Uh, Samir Hassan from the Young Invincibles, Dwayne Wright, Melanie Krellis. You can correct the spelling when you come up. Marcia Collier and and Lisa Nishimura and Timothy Hunter. Hopefully they're still here. Hi. Okay, how long will it take for them to get here? They're at security? Then they come. Okay, since they're not all here, we're going to move to the next panel and we'll let them come when they get in. So the next panel, no, we're going to wait because the rest of them is not here. Okay? Thank you so much. Sorry. We're trying to accommodate your requests, but we wanted to all be together. Okay, so the next panel consists of four people. Bruce, I think that's Jacobs or Jacoby, uh, Red Washburn, Sakia Fletcher, and Anelius Desong. And we are gonna ask that you all adhere to a five minute clock so that we can get to hear everybody. Thank you. Okay. So please give us your name and your testimony. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways and Southeast Queens, fighter for the Rockaways and Southeast Queens, U.S. Navy veteran, 9-11 first responder, and medical and religious freedom. There's a lot of questions, and also I had to say he's not here now, but we can't keep on attacking rich people because rich people do give a lot of charity, so not every rich person is a danger to our community. Uh, on this budget, on this thing, I don't like the idea, first of all, that a nonprofit, how I don't know how they get the contract, is running the CUNY. Why can't CUNY itself handle this kind of work? There's enough youth and enough people in this city that could do this kind of work. Okay. Why can't CUNY hire these people instead of hiring a nonprofit that I do not, maybe they're the greatest nonprofit, but the idea that this nonprofit, how they get the contracts, they sit in conjunction with CUNY. I know from other stuff in my neighborhoods that a lot of nonprofits don't exactly care about 
the people. So my argument is here is that they have $40 billion worth of land. The buildings, Q, uh, like Kingsborough Community College Library is a total mess. And other libraries in the city are a total mess. The idea that they're not willing, instead of leasing out these buildings, getting rid of some of this property and put it into the school system, put it into a new library, with the way that money is you know, hard in the city now, the thought that they don't want to do that, there's something wrong with it. Now, my idea, they say that the, with the workforce, where this money is going, is this money being investigated? A lot of research money, it sounds good, but then you got millions and millions of dollars that is unaccounted for. They already had a problem a couple of years ago. What's to say that they're not going to have a problem again? In my opinion, there's a very good chance that the same problems could happen. I think that CUNY itself should hire in the CUNY system and SUNY, whatever, people from their communities to work instead of nonprofits and all of this. Now, another thing, they, got it, they say that they're giving out all kind of one, two point billion, they're throwing around figures that people can't even walk the streets in their neighborhoods and they can't get a job. Of course, I went to college. And yeah, I was a veteran. I got four-year degree. And you know what? It didn't get me nothing. If it was due to, I want people to go to school. But New York's, I had New York City Transit Authority. It helped me. It helped me to get a good paying job. They're throwing around numbers. What kind of jobs are these jobs that they're getting people? Are they using people for like minimum wage jobs? Minimum wage jobs, you can't afford to keep going to college. Or are they giving these people good jobs. The way that he was explaining to me, it sounded like they're using the guys going to school. They act like he had to give them experience, but they can't afford to live. So of course, there's not going to be a lot of guys who not be going to college. It doesn't matter. You want to try to diversify and all this. It doesn't really work that way. If you can't afford to go to school, I don't care if it's cheap. If you can't pay your rent and you can't you know, pay for safety in your neighborhoods. How are you going to go to school? You have to pay to support your family. It's not so easy. You know, everybody wants to go to school. If you have good parents, they got a few dollars, they could afford to keep you in their house. Yeah, you could afford it. But otherwise, it's very hard. Yeah, they give you grants to go to school, but it's not really grants to help you live. And the last thing I'm going to say is that you could be a good student in CUNY, and you could get ahead. And it doesn't matter what you give people, the person themselves have to concentrate and want to get ahead in life. Giving everything and just putting a guy in school, that's not the problem. It's keeping a person in school to do good with their life. Thank you very much. Thank you, next panelist. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sakia Fletcher. I'm SGA president of Mega Evers College. I want to first and foremost say thank you for um, allowing me the time to speak and to Chairperson um, Barron. I just want to say thank you also. Um, I'm here to talk about one thing, and this is capital investment in Mega Evers College. Um, I know we had a CUNY representative that was here, and he spoke um, briefly about some of the capital investments that they have in up-and-coming schools. However, in the projects that I have seen and in the projects um, in communication with um, administration at my school, there's no capital investment to get students at Mega Evers College out of dormitory classrooms. There's a huge concern because as a, a, a campus that is a senior college, not a community college, we are the only campus that still uh, occupies and uses portable trailers. Um, this is very concerning because not only uh, does the college use the trailers, but also the high school uh, preparatory, Mega Evers College Preparatory High School. Um, I'm here today not to uh, point fingers or to accuse anybody, but to 
see how we can work into getting Mega Evers College a new building and uh, investing capital investments in this college. Mega Evers College is a very important college, not only, I believe, to you, um, Chairwoman, because you have a large constituency at this Brooklyn College, but also I know that I personally had classroom with your son, Jawanza. Um, we were on the same, in the same class, public administration, public policy, where we uh, had class in the dormitories. And when we had to do our project, our um, PowerPoint presentation, we actually had to wear our coats during the presentation. The reason why we had to wear our coats because these dormitories are too cold in the wintertime. Uh, usually when the summertime comes, it's too hot. The conditions in these dormitories are something that is very concerning in this day and age that as, a, as an institution that is named and, uh, after Mega Evers College, we still have to deal with uh, academic conditions that is really deploring and really speaks to the foundation and makes students believe that do we really care? Do students, do the community, does the, does the city really care about students? Do they wanna see improvements? Do we, how much are we really investing in social economic uh, mobility of African American students? Um, our college has 85% uh, or, or higher of African American population. We are a PBI, a predominantly black institution. 73% uh, of the population is female population. They come from homes of single parent households. Um, the importance of the college, I know that, I know that um, uh, Chairwoman, you already know the importance of the college. We graduate uh, women of color who go on to be council members, that go on to be uh, elected officials who are graduates of um, law school, city, uh, CUNY law, and go on to do great things. However, at the college right now, we cannot, we don't have room. We don't have room for classrooms. The capacity of the college has grown to the point where the that the population is not growing because the capacity and the size of the college is not increasing. So that means that our enrollment is actually going down. Be students cannot go here. They don't, they don't see it as, an, as a place to go because there, there really is no space. We talk about pipelines and we talk about uh, 12 through K pipelines to college. However, at my college, Mega Evers College, there's no space to put these, to put these students in. Um, right now at the college, um, there, we, ha we are really watching the neighborhood be gentrified. We are watching uh, new buildings and capital investments be go up around the surrounding areas. However, Mega Evers College is not on the table. The, it's not in any conversation. It's not mentioned in terms of getting a new building, getting students out of portable dormitories. These portable dormitories have been there for almost 15 plus years. And, and I haven't heard, I haven't seen, and I personally would love to talk to, to you and anyone else from the council of how we can really move to getting students to have appropriate um, academic infrastructure. Um, I appreciate your time and I just really want to see CUNY, the city and the state really invest in Mega Evers College for, to really increase the enrollment of not only the high school, the preparatory high school, and, and that preparatory high school was one of the top high schools in Brooklyn they graduate on an 85% uh, ratio where their students go on to Ivy League colleges and their students go on to do great things. Um, however, the, the high school itself doesn't have a gymnasium. So I just really uh, wanna work towards how we can get Mega Evers College and Mega Evers uh, Preparatory High School to have uh, adequate academic uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much. and. Uh, we can certainly look into the fact that I believe the vice president said that they do meet with local persons at the college campus to try to strategize and see what they can do. So we can certainly pursue that further. Thank you so much. Okay, we're now back to the USS panel. We're gonna call Timothy Hunter, Samir Hassan, uh, Dr. Wayne Wright, Melanie Cruellas, Cruellas, Marsha Collier, and Lisa Nishimura. And you can certainly give us a correct pronunciation of your name. 
in your testimony. That's the last one. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll start on my left and ask that uh, you share your testimony. And we will put you on the clock for five minutes each. Thank you. You may begin. Give us your name and your testimony. All right. So um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman of the um, Inez Baron. Um, as always, it's good seeing you and um, the other members of the higher committee. Um, my name is Timothy Hunter, chairperson of University Student Senate and student trustee for the City University of New York. Um, I'm here because uh, you know there's a lot of problems that we're dealing with here in CUNY, and um, you know my colleague Sakia highlighted some of those problems as well, specifically at Medgar Evers um, and at other college campuses. Um, we understand that the city council, like you know, handles a lot of our community colleges, and of course there are some specific asks that we want to make sure that the city council um, strongly, strongly considers before we continue. Um, first things first, that I definitely want to highlight before we even get into anything else is um, the university stance on tuition, um, and I heard the other city council member, uh, like I think it's Senate, um, council member Brad um, Lander, speak about tuition compare, in comparison to Ivy League and private schools. Um, but we need to understand that like, the City University of New York is not a private school and should not be compared to these schools because we are of a different caliber that serves a different constituency. And it's important that we continue to keep that schooling affordable. Not only that, but um, city council uh, like, you know, funds the community colleges for the most part, and also the city, the community college tuition is the highest here um, like compared to our 75 mile radius of schools in New York City. So there are SUNY, I think there's only two other like community colleges that have tuition rates that are above 5,000, but our 4,800 mark is among the highest in a 75 mile radius, which means we're, we're like the least affordable community college in like the area of like the tri-state. Um, so kind of like seeing that like holistically and seeing that those are the same numbers that like, you know, our CFO put up in presentation to the board, but for some reason uh, neglected or omitted, um, you know, during his uh, testimony, it kind of worries me that, um, you know, the council may get misled or other members of the council may get misled when it comes to the talk of tuition policy. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, the cost of, of like earning a degree has, has like just increased dramatically. You know, you were fortunate enough to attend, you know, free CUNY and uh, we, that's something that we also want to kind of get back to. However, it's impossible to do that if we continue to increase tuition and put the burden on the backs of our students. Um, uh, as we kind of look at the, the other things that we want to achieve, another one of our big talking points that we spoke about briefly is single stop, um, being a one-stop shop for all. So if you look at our testimony on page two, um, there's a, a student named Taylor McMahon who uh, attended Hostos Community College, who had to skip breakfast and lunch and a lot of other things, um, and like had no financial support at home. But due to like having a single stop on on her campus, uh, she was able to kind of like uh, you know help like use like help like file her taxes, um, kind of use that space as a one stop shop for everything that she needed, which turned into money for her to like you know like. Uh, like buy more textbooks and they also helped her to apply for food stamps and also other SNAP benefits as well. Um, and not only that, but then some single stops also give opportunities um, you know, for food insecurities. And if you look at the third page, um, we have those things listed, such as like you know, providing training and outreach to students um, to promote awareness and fight stigmas, um, offering special programs and tax preparation services for students. The problem with single stop though is that it's only at all of our community colleges, one senior college, um, and it's not at any other like you know, of our like uh, senior colleges like City Tech, Medgar Evers, Baruch, and um, you know, we don't want to call it like single stop, but we're trying to refer to it as like single stop like support services due to some like contract confusion. We don't want to like liberate that, but we think that you know, this is something that CUNY has asked for last year in their budget. I'm surprised to see that they didn't ask for it this year again, um, which kind of worries me as well. But last year they asked for 2.4 million dollars to expand single stop to all of their campuses, to all senior colleges. Um, that's something that we definitely support. It costs, I think, 220,000 to run a single stop per campus. So um, instead of just doing a one-time, like, you know, million-dollar investment in food insecurity and then 
us having to come and beg for it again next year, we think maybe a $2.4 million investment in single stop that like also can be a vehicle for not only food insecurity, but also menstrual product insecurity that we know that the Women's Caucus is extremely interested in. Um, we think that would be some great opportunities to get more involved. Um, in the interest of time, I want to talk about some of the other things. Of course, you know, we fully support an expansion of ASAP and the restoration of our child care services, which is later on in our testimony, and also our menstrual equity at our community colleges. Um, that's something that we've been speaking with Councilmember Helen Rosenthal about. Um, but we also want to make sure that, like, you know, we're helping our students, um, like, you know, through CUNY citizenship now and expanding that to multiple campuses. Um, one of our priority campuses uh, are, is Staten Island. So we would encourage, you know, we had a conversation with um, the staff of Debbie Rose. We know that she's not like um, really like active right now, um, but we want to make sure that we kind of bring a CUNY citizenship now to St College of Staten Island, so that we have the students there have opportunities, you know, to you know not only like figure out what's next steps, um, like you know after they graduate, but also stay around in New York City and contribute to the community at large, and you know potentially you know be in these same seats, listening to us and helping us fund higher education as a whole. So thank you for your time. Next panelist. Um, I... Great. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Melanie Cruvelis, and I'm the Senior Manager of Policy and Advocacy at Young Invincibles. We are a nonprofit dedicating, uh, dedicated to elevating young adults in the political process and expanding economic opportunities for our generation. I wanted to thank uh, the New York City Council and the Committee on Higher Education and uh, Chair Barron for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Today's pre preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on Higher Education comes at a critical moment for New York's college students. Today, nine out of every 10 jobs created in the US goes to those with a college degree. Here in New York City, workers with a bachelor degree earn on average $550 more a week than those with a high school diploma alone. So while there are multiple pathways to a living wage career, a college degree does remain one of the best bets a person can make to attain long-term economic stability. And as we heard earlier today, researchers point out that here in New York City, the CUNY system in particular is one of the nation's most important resources for propelling generations of low-income students into the middle class. And that's a really critical point given the makeup and experiences of the CUNY student body. We know that about half of CUNY students come from households making less than $20,000 a year. Uh, and we also know that CUNY students are experiencing homelessness and hunger at alarming rates. Uh, a 2019 survey of 22,000 CUNY undergraduates found about half uh, struggle with food insecurity, while nearly 15% experience homelessness in a given year. We do also know that CUNY students are balancing their lives as college students with responsibilities outside of school, including working part-time or full-time and caretaking responsibilities. In short, for many CUNY students, college is what, just one of the many responsibilities and costs that they face. Today, as we consider the city's commitment to the public higher education system, we have to recognize the reality for New York's college students. While CUNY's tuition prices are lower than many other public university systems, though increasing now at both the, soon, the senior and community college, CUNY students are also living in one of the expense, most expensive regions in the country. So affording tuition is just one piece of the puzzle when it comes uh, to all of that students must cover, including rent, food, transportation, health care, and child care. So thus, we urge any enacted uh, budget for fiscal year 2021 must recognize that reality. And as such, we urge the council and the mayor to build on recent investments made towards investing, uh, addressing basic needs among CUNY's college students. That includes uh, the recent pilot aimed at addressing food insecurity on campus, um, as well as our support for single stops, as Tim just mentioned, um, and recent investments in CUNY campus child care, uh, which had reversed a decades of flat investment in campus child care. We also are urging the council to work with uh, electeds in Albany and beyond uh, to support investments in programs like CUNY ASAP and ACE and are going to continue to work with students to urge our state electeds to address the serious implications of the TAP gap and its impact on student success. As the council and the mayor work towards an enacted budget, we also believe it is critical to hear from students themselves and the challenges and opportunities they identify in their campuses. Today, I'm joined by Samer Hassan, our policy and advocacy fellow at Young Invincibles and a senior at Columbia College. I'm also joined by three uh, CUNY students and young advocates, Marsha, Lisa, and Duane uh, from CUNY colleges. So I urge the Committee on Higher Education to consider the concerns and the solutions that they are bringing to the table today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Melanie. 
Uh, good afternoon, my name is Samer Hassan and I am a senior at Columbia University studying political science. I am also the Northeast Policy and Advocacy Fellow with Young Invincibles. I want to thank the New York City Council and the Committee of Higher Education for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Columbia University is known for its large endowment and its Ivy League status, but I am here to tell you that the reality between its beautiful facade and the students within it are very different. I transferred from a community college and was instantly aware of the inequities at school. As I listen to the struggles of my fellow college peers around New York City, I can't help but notice the dynamics between community college students and four-year colleges and how they mirror each other. There is a connection between these public and private institutions, and that is their inability to tackle real-world problems, like basic needs, of which so many New York City students face. Student homelessness and housing insecurity are rampant in not only the city, but across the nation. In fact, even at Columbia, there are students sleeping in 24-hour libraries and only eating food provided by school events. In today's society, it is normal for students to have to choose between food or a textbook, there is an inherent problem here, one that I don't believe many colleges are taking into account. The reality that many of New York's students can't afford to have the luxury to just be students. The average student has many additional costs to cover than just tuition. And this is not limited to Columbia students, but to every college student across the city that I have encountered. I am able to attend Columbia due to a prestigious scholarship for first-generation low-income students. It pays my tuition, but only my tuition. While the scholarship itself is purported to be an amazing opportunity for its recipients, the reality is that students, myself included, are coming from nothing and require more aid than the school is willing to help with. For example, our financial aid office told us to apply for the Pell Grant as it would help us cover the cost of housing. Unfortunately, after receiving the grant, Columbia took the aid and applied it to the scholarship I already had, essentially turning my scholarship into a last dollar program. State and federal financial student aid should go to the students who desperately need the money, not the institutions who have the connections to establish other avenues of financial backing. I'm here to, to ask the City Council to provide housing, transportation, and food programs that support all college and university students in New York City. I am here to ask you to hold more private institutions like Columbia University accountable to ensure that the basic needs of students are met and that eligible non-tuition grants be given directly to students who have a duty to ensure all of our students have a level playing field in order to attain a quality education. Our school tells first-generation low-income students like me to focus on our studies and will eventually begin climbing the ladder of social capital and economic opportunity. But we respond by saying that we can't even get to these ladders in the first place because we're too busy working just to live. What we want and desperately need is a level playing field. We are smart, talented, and civically engaged members of society but you will never know that because we're too busy just trying to survive. Thank you. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon. My name is Marcia Collier, and I'm a senior at City College studying medicine and psychology. Thank you to Councilwoman Barron and the Committee on Higher Education for the opportunity to testify today's hearing. I'm here today to ask the City Council to urge Albany to action and close the tap gap and to consider my plan to generate the revenue needed to help fill a portion of that gap. I would also like to ask City legislators to expand the CUNY ASAP and ACE programs across New York City. CUNY and SUNY system's maximum tap award in recent years does not cover the full extent of tuition. 42% of City College students receive TAP and use it as their primary method to pay their tuition. That's 6,739 students at City College alone. According to the Professional Staff Congress Union, there is $139 million deficit that leaves CUNY to cover 74 million of that gap. Consequences are, but not limited to, staff shortages, limited course availability, increased workloads on remaining staff, and fewer advisors or resources for students overall. Prior to 2011, students would have their tuition costs covered by TAP. 
with colleges receiving adequate TAP payments to help cover costs, including libraries and adequate support services. In my time at City College, I've seen my fellow classmates drop out of college because it was no longer affordable unless they could find thousands of dollars to pay off the balance. Furthermore, remaining balances puts holds on students' accounts, leaving them unable to register for classes or receive a transcript. As a low-income student, it is crucial TAP covers the full tuition amount so I may access the resources and be able to afford to stay in school. The early outcomes reports for the Sydney University of New York CUNY ASAP program stated the success of the program over the past 10 years. As of fall 2009, more than 90% of ASAP two-year graduates indicated plans to transfer to four-year colleges. Students attending four-year colleges, like myself, have found it difficult to afford the $127 MetroCard monthly for school. <coughs> Student fees, tuition, food, housing, and transportation costs make it difficult to keep a budget for low-income students manageable and realistic. ASAP ASAP graduates overwhelmingly credit the financial incentives and comprehensive advising as to why they graduated. The, this program has been piloted at two senior CUNY colleges in the form of the Accelerate, Complete, and Engage program, or ACE, which has already seen positive outcomes. It would be more impactful if all four-year colleges had this program, which would result in higher graduation rates, less incidence of re requiring welfare benefits, and increased tax contribution from educated individuals that are now in a higher tax bracket. I'm proposing a plan that New York City may be interested in piloting. A 10 cent increase on the toll of New York City bridges and tunnels will generate about $56 million a year. Over the course of one and a half years, the CUNY tap gap would be fully closed. This small investment would, would improve our college system and provide more tax generating graduates, which would bring in a lasting return. Thank you. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon, my name is Dwayne Wright and I'm a senior at Borough of Manhattan Community College. I will be attending Baruch in the fall, pursuing a degree in business. Thank you to the Councilwoman Barron and Council and Committee on Higher Education for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. I am here today to ask the City Council to increase investments in CUNY, both for programs and services that better support students through, through to college completion, but also to cover the cost of tuition for students. Over nearly the past decade, CUNY has increased tuition significantly, and as a result, has become increasingly unaffordable to many. Even with state programs like the Excelsior Scholarship, programs are so restrictive that many people are not eligible. College was created as a means to, bet, a, means to a better quality of life. <clears throat> However, the given Given the rising cost of college, that is not always the, always the case in 1636. Traditional higher education within the United States began in Boston. Other states soon caught on and then the rest of the world. However, with the boom, there emerged a lack of room for certain ethnic groups due to the cost of college. In the last four decades, the price of college has increased exponentially and caused the student loan crisis. Today, over one million people attend college with a staggering 70% of them in debt. The financial epidemic cripples students nationwide. As a result, it is hurting our, our, econ our economy and the financial future of students as they cannot afford to put a down payment on a home and build and build other avenues of wealth as they are burdened with debt. College is expensive enough for tuition, however above tuition costs such as housing, food, and transportation make college less of a reality. In fact, 42% of CUNY students had household incomes less than $20,000 annually. In addition, in a city like New York, it is immensely expensive to be a student, in fact, a report by the Hope Center at Temple University recently revealed that 14% of CUNY students experience homelessness and over half have experienced housing insecurity. It is clear that CUNY is not adequately supporting students. Why aren't more programs like ASAP, which have been shown to double graduation rates, 
being expanded? Why aren't more academic, financial, and other support services being adequately funded across each CUNY institution? These are the questions that I ask today in hopes that you provide more students with the resources that they need to be successful and graduate from college. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lisa Nishimura. I'm a senior at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, graduating this May with my bachelor's degree in criminology. Thank you, Councilwoman Barron and the Committee on Higher Education for the opportunity to share my story and present challenges that I faced during my time at John Jay in hopes of improving CUNY policies to allow more students like myself the opportunity to afford college. I'm here today to ask you to take steps to provide funding opportunities for students like me who cannot receive either federal or state financial aid due to their inability to provide certain documentation, something which is outside of their control. I would also like to see the eligibility requirements for programs like ACE to be made available to more students in the future and would like the eligibility criteria to be expanded to allow for more sophomores to enter into the program. These investments will help ensure that more students, like me, have access to financial aid and other programs that help make college affordable. Throughout my entire five years at John Jay, I was unable to receive any state or federal aid, having solely to rely on scholarships and work to pay my tuition. While I received a $1,000 scholarship for my honors program every semester, this scholarship was not enough to cover even half of my tuition. As a result, every semester, I was met with a bursar's hold, preventing me from registering for classes until I paid off the remaining balance, which was usually $3,000. To some, $3,000 may, may be a small amount. However, coming from a low-income family with a single mother, this amount could have been used to pay for my rent, bills, or food. To obtain aid, I have tried numerous avenues, all with dead ends. I tried applying for the Excelsior Scholarship, but because it required FAFSA completion and documentation, I was not able to apply. I even tried filing to be an independent student. Because if granted the status, I will be eligible to, bo to both state and federal aid. Ultimately, I was denied independent status. The bit of hope I had to not relive the same financial nightmare I had experienced came crashing down. On top of it all, the financial aid office was not helpful in finding alternative means of funding. They simply said there was nothing they could do, and that was the end of it. Program requirements also continue to prevent me from participating in other programs. Even programs such as the ACE program that provides funding for textbooks and free metro cards, I could not be a part of due to certain requirements. As an honor student, I was not eligible. And the following year, when the policy was changed to admit honor students, I was no longer eligible because I was a sophomore and not an entering freshman. Despite the socioeconomic barriers I continue to face, being able to graduate is a huge feat and one that I take pride in. However, I know that this is not the, real the reality for many students who are in my situation. I once asked again the New York City Council to invest in programs that support students who are in situations similar to mine and help them realize their college dreams. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for their testimony. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by a member of the committee, Council Member Ulrich, who's here. And certainly your testimony is critical to what it is that we are trying to improve in CUNY's um, programs and intent and their plan. Certainly all the things you've talked about are critical in increasing tuition, even though they've frozen it for four years or whatever. It's still increasing much more than what had been previously. And we want to continue to make sure that Albany does its part, that they increase the support that they give and not rely on student tuition, as I said earlier, to operate the college and the programs that are going on. So we want to thank you all, encourage you, as I said, I didn't have to uh, pay tuition because CUNY was free. And that certainly is the objective that we have going forward to make sure that we can make sure that post-secondary education is free to all of those who are residents of the city and who have the desire to go on and achieve those goals. So thank you once again for your testimony and wish you all the best. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councilmember Ulrich, do you have any comments? Okay, thank you. Okay, we have one more panel. 
Annalise DeSong, Santana Alvarado, Amelia DeCordin, you can correct the pronunciation when you come up, and Deborah Bell. Okay. Thank you. So as you're seated, you may begin in the order that you choose. Good afternoon, my name is Annalise Young and I am a freshman at the City College of New York pursuing a major in business administration. I'm also a senator for our undergraduate student government. I'd like to thank Councilwoman Barron and the Committee, Committee of Higher Education for holding this meeting and allowing me to speak on community funding. Um, believing that higher education is a privilege that one should finance themselves, whether that be public or private, contradicts the need for an educated working class as a common benefit. While the state is required to pay the expense of the Excelsior Scholarship, Neither the state nor the city are required to provide funding to finance the TAP gap. The current expense of the TAP gap is $79 million, and if an effort was made to close this gap, CUNY schools could use that money for student resources instead of compensating for what neither the student nor TAP can pay for. It could fund support services like single stop and expand them to all CUNY campuses. The TAP gap hurts students struggling in struggling communities the most because when more students cannot afford to pay the rest of their tuition, Schools that are already underfunded have to allocate a larger portion of their already insufficient budgets just to give underprivileged students access to an education. CUNY levels the playing field for students from all backgrounds and contributes largely to the middle class of New York City. This is not something we want to lose because we are unable to see the importance of closing the tap gap and funding certain programs. Compelling CUNY to subsidize cost deficits for students in impractical, is impractical and unfair to the students they serve. It is important to fund uh, programs such as ASAP, SEEK, and Single Stop so that underprivileged students can pursue their education on grounds equal to their peers. College degrees are becoming more and more necessary. Removing barriers to obtaining one is critical to ensuring that more people can participate in the middle class. With that being said, the Council has the potential to lift an enormous burden off of students. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. What a beautiful day. Um, my name is Santana Alvarado, and I am the chairperson of the New York Public Interest Research Group, NYPERG, student board of directors, and a CUNY Hunter College student. NYPERG is the state's largest nonpartisan student advocacy organization. Our board of directors consists of college and university students elected from campuses with NYPERG chapters across the state. Through NYPERG, CUNY students are educated and empowered to impact policy decisions on issues that affect us, as well as the community at large, including decisions about funding for public higher education. We appreciate this opportunity to share our suggestions in response to the mayor's preliminary budget proposal. We urge you to freeze public college tuition at community colleges. Community colleges are a local and potentially affordable path to a higher degree or a better job for many New Yorkers, including those who need to be close to their families, homes, and jobs. Moreover, community colleges provide crucial job training and retraining for underemployed and unemployed workers in a rapidly shifting economic environment. New York Community College's tuition costs are among the highest in the nation, creating a barrier where access must be paramount. Tuition rates at community colleges have been frozen for the past four fiscal years. However, without adequate support for the city or state, from the city or state, CUNY Community Colleges will be raising tuition $200 next year. This will be an unfair burden placed on some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers, particularly those who do not qualify for financial aid, such as those who cannot commit to a full-time course load. 
Currently, nearly 40% of CUNY's community college students attend part-time. We have heard from many students who are parents, have jobs, and other responsibilities which do not allow them to take on a full course load. We urge the city council to ensure that students and families are protected from the burden of a tuition increase at CUNY community colleges. CUNY's budget request includes a 250 per full-time equivalent increase at community colleges from the city and state. We urge this funding request be met, and we urge that the city cover the additional 16 million needed to ensure tuition remains frozen. NYPIRG appreciates the attention brought to food insecurity by CUNY and the city, including the food insecurity pilot program launched this academic year. We support the scaling of cafeteria voucher programs to more students and more cap campuses. We look forward to continuing the work together in service to campus food pantries and by supporting policies which combat hunger on campus. We urge the New York City Council to provide sustained funding that reduce and eliminate college student food and housing insecurity more permanently. NYPIRG also urges the New York City Council to provide funding to hire new campus counselors and provide training to current and new staff and volunteers. Critically, these costs must be added to CUNY's operating budget allocations from the city and state and must not burden students with additional fees. When we talk about supporting students' mental health programs, we don't need to further saddle students with the cost. That's not helping. Many students are eligible for public benefits that could help them make it through college and finish their degree. The single stop program at CUNY provides an essential service in helping connect students to the millions of dollars in public benefits that they are eligible for, including housing, SNAP benefits, health insurance, tax, tax preparation, and financial counseling. Single Stop has received national recognition for its tremendous success, and we support the expansion of Single Stop offices to all CUNY campuses. NYPIRG also urges the City Council to watchdog proposed cuts to CUNY childcare funding in Governor Cuomo's executive budget for New York State and guard against any possible program cuts. Additionally, ASAP and other opportunity programs including Search for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge, or SEEK, and College Discovery offer many benefits to students and to our city, and they should be expanded. CUNY has also proposed a Math Start ASAP pilot program expansion to insensibly, to insensibly address math proficiency among 1,200 students over the next four years, and to expand its ACE program, the four-year adaptation of the successful CUNY ASAP, to 5,000 students over the next four years. NYPIRG urges the New York City Council to protect and increase funding to opportunity programs, including the two pilot program expansions listed above. I'm a product of Bronx Community College, of ASAP, of Single Stop, and all of these services that we're here to recognize and advocate for, and I know that there are thousands of students who are struggling in New York City that need our support. So I'm so glad to be here to testify, and I urge you all to continue working with us. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Deborah Bell. I'm the executive director of Professional Staff Congress, which is the union that represents 30,000 faculty and staff at CUNY. We are here to acknowledge the role of this committee and, and you, Chairwoman Barron, in your advocacy for students, for faculty, for staff over the years. We, we appreciate it, and I personally appreciate your acknowledgement of Women's History Month at the beginning of our hearing today. Uh, in addition, I want to acknowledge the fact that the city has funded our recently negotiated contract. The state has not, in a full sense. The city has stepped up, and that contract is an important piece in being responsive to what the students are seeking today. That is to say, providing salary increases, fringe benefits, stabilizing factor, in the university and committing to do that over the, the period of the contract. We have, as you know, we have worked with CUNY and with the city to make significant improvements in adjunct pay. That is going to make a huge difference to students as well because we are ensuring that adjuncts will have the time to meet with students and work with them to succeed in their courses. Having said that, we are here today to ask you to consider an additional $81 million 
over and above what the mayor has proposed in his budget and over and above the $23 million we hope you will seek to continue the council-funded programs. We support doing that, but we want to draw your attention to the fact that there is an opportunity here to make some creative moves in terms of serving the student needs at CUNY. We propose an additional $30 million for community colleges. For a cohort of scholars and counselors, 280, and this is on page two of my testimony, 280 One City Fellows. This is a concept that Barbara Bowen brought to you several years back. She unfortunately couldn't be here today because she's in Albany with our members advocating for more state money. 150 new full-time faculty positions in the community colleges, 140 new academic advisors, career counselors, and mental health counselors. And I will say, Chairwoman Barron, in response to your question to CUNY, the union's approach is that CUNY needs one mental health counselor for every thousand FTE students at the university. That requires a significant increase, and that those increases vary from college to college, as the university indicated, but the, they have to hire more people to do this work, and career counselors, and academic advisors, to really serve the students. We also support CUNY's request for $34 million for the senior colleges. We think, you know, the math, uh, Vice Chancellor Sapienza explained, it's bringing that con contribution rate up to date with the HEPI index, but we would recommend using that in a new, more creative way. Again, a One City Fellows program to provide 175 new full-time faculty positions and 150 staff advisor and counselor positions in the senior colleges. We believe that by identifying a program that crosses community and senior college lines, it can help bind together the entire university. It can be a focus for diversity hiring that you've stressed over the years to CUNY. It can also be a focus for moving part-time faculty into full-time faculty positions. There are a lot of experienced, hardworking part-time faculty who really can serve the students better if they are appointed to full-time positions. Having said that, we are in opposition to the wellness fee, as of course all the students are, but we, so we believe that other funds should be dedicated to expanding the university's capacity. Also, because I'm, I'm going to run out of time, we support the $4 million for program cuts that were in the preliminary budget, as the students have talked about, $102 million for increased costs, costs for building maintenance and um, energy costs, and the $11.5 million it will cost to freeze tuition at the community colleges. This is all critical. So we also support the capital budget request. I just want to put that in. Um, and uh, appreciate the questions you raised with the university. We do believe they are doing their best, and it is, it is an opportunity this year because the states agreed to match funding twice over to really focus on capital funding. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the panel for coming and for sharing your perspective on how we can improve CUNY. We appreciate your testimony. Are there any others wishing to provide testimony at that hearing? Seeing none, we will now adjourn this hearing. Thank you very much.